I'm not sure what you mean by the clinical aspect. Well, a clinical interview, as you know what a clinical interview is, right? Of course I know what a clinical interview is. All right, is. then we seem to be having problems with it. With regard to a clinical interview, ma'am, isn't that a situation where you sit across from an individual and you talk to them about the issue that is at hand? Isn't that true? You interview them. You ask questions. You do an assessment. So when you are interviewing, you're not talking then, right? Mr. Martinez, yes I Yes or no? My question is, are you talking yes or no? Mr. Martinez, are you angry at me? my god that's gold <laughs> we knew we were expecting a load of laughs in this one mr martinez are you angry at me oh that's brilliant hello youtube and odyssey Hello everybody. Welcome to part 45 of the Jodi Arias Wicked Witch the Word series, day 41 of the trial. Uh, this um, is the concluding day of um, Alice LaViolette's direct testimony uh, for the defence. And later on in this, Mr Martinez himself gets up, doesn't he? Yeah, and that's the bit I'm looking forward to. Yeah. It's going to be pretty biblical, isn't it, when he gets up? <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Um, I can just imagine that he just explodes at her as soon as he gets up. I mean, I think he more or less did that with Jodie, as I remember. He just went full on at her. He did, just yeah. Just didn't hold back. So, and he did the same with Samuel. So I think we should expect the same, you know, in this day of testimony. So we're really looking forward to that. However, the majority of this, I think, you know, the three quarters of it is... Um, is uh, uh, Wilmot's direct examination. So um, you can get through that later on, Wang gets up. So that's something to look forward to, as we say. Yeah. Um, so thank you to everyone who has been so patient and waited for this. Um, we're just going to give you our usual disclaimers. We're going to be interrupting this with our commentary. If you don't want to hear our commentary and you just want to watch the, you know, the day of the trial without us interfering in it, um, then we will provide the link in the description to the original video. And also, um, whatever we say in this is just our opinion. We don't expect you to agree with us. We don't expect you to subscribe to it. And we don't expect you to say what take what we say is gospel, do we? No, it's just our opinion. Yeah. Also, we are not professionals. We don't say we are. We don't claim to be. We have no training whatsoever. We're just two ordinary people who just say what we see. Yeah, um, and in this one, there's a lot of um, the deep brown stuff to be smelled, isn't there? Oh, a lot of it. Even from 10 years ago. <laughs> the smell still lingers, doesn't it, in the courtroom from, from what comes out of her mouth. Okay, uh, sit back, get something to drink, get something to eat, get something to smoke, um, and enjoy day 41 of the trial, part 45 of our series. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's get get into it. Strap in tight. Let's go. All right. The record will show the presence of the defendant and all counsel. The jury is not present. Mr. Nurmi, you have a motion. Yes, Judge. Uh, at this time, we're going to renew our motion for uh, sequestration of the jury. Um, last night, uh, there was uh, a apparently, however they were obtained, at least at this point, we're not for sure, interview tapes uh, of Miss Arias's parents uh, in Wairica, California, were obtained by the media, as well as uh, journal entries from Miss Arias's entire uh, journal that was seized during a warrant. Uh, in conjunction with this motion, and in conjunction with the reports, one of the reports mentioned that the county attorney's office had provided these diaries to Miss Arias. So consistent with this motion and also the corollary of the misconduct motions that are still pending before this court and are cumulative in nature, we would be asking that the county attorney advise the court either deny having done that or concede having done that on the record at this time. 
No chance. Mr. Martinez? I don't see the relevance of whether or not the county attorney's office provided that or not. That's uh, an issue beyond my control, but my understanding was that there was a uh, public record request. I don't know who made the public record request for the um, two videos that Mr. Nermi's talking about. They actually don't watch the media as much as the defense counsel seems to, so I don't really know whether or not that was played or not. Additionally, there was a public record request, my understanding, for the journals, and that, that was something that was provided. Um, there are many public records requests that are pending for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office right now, and I don't know what they all involve, but I do know that there are many. Well, judges, this court knows, and the case law tells us that this case must be tried in the courtroom, not in the media. That's one of the one of the the boundaries. If we want to try this case outside the courtroom, and that's what the county attorney's office seems to be conceding now, I'm willing to do that as well. But as it relates to the jury, this is the kind of information we've just heard the county attorney's office concede that they are putting out there that the jurors can hear. If we are to believe. You know, the court asks the question of the jurors every morning, have you seen, or not every morning, on a weekly basis, have you seen anything on the media in a group? Uh, no one raises their hand. No one wants to be singled out. But to believe that to be true is to believe an absolute fiction. Bless Kirk Nermy. But does he think he's in a film? He probably thinks he's on stage, yeah. It sounds more like a soliloquy than an argument, doesn't it? Yeah, he's not exactly putting up a strong argument. Well, I think he knows the eyes of the world are on him and he's playing up to it, so uh, good luck to him. Yeah. It is a fairy tale to, to, uh, to assume that this jury is not hearing any of this. It is all over the news, be it local or national. So, again, you know, if this release of information done by the county attorney's office, this does affect Ms. Arias' right to a fair trial. It is disseminating information that would not otherwise come before the jury and affects her right to a fair trial. If we, again, if we were to believe this fiction that the jury doesn't see any of this, okay. But again, it is a fiction that is beyond belief. I might add to this, coming in this morning, I saw the media photographer, who I believe works for HLN, move forward towards the door as he saw the jury bus. Jurors number one, four, six, and 17, and I believe 13 were all coming in. I do not know if they were photographed or not. At this point, I couldn't tell based on the way the position that the gentleman was holding the camera, but we have to concede these facts as well. These are facts that the jury is not excluding. There is no doubt about it. We don't even need to rely on a fiction to know that the jurors were photographed this morning because, or cameras were outside there this morning because I, I witnessed it myself. So, Judge, given all this, I'm asking the court to no longer rely on this fiction that this jury is not seeing any of this media and sequester the jury immediately. Okay, firstly, um, Nermi is assuming that the jury has seen this coverage. Um, and they can't control the press. Nobody can control the press. Um, maybe the security can, but maybe they need better security. I don't know. But the thing that jumped out at me was when he said that um, it's a fairy tale um, to assume, or a fairy tale to assume that um, the jurors aren't seeing it. Well, their whole defence is a bloody fairy tale. I know that's what about her, isn't it? But yeah, he's like saying, well. We're tell, telling a fairy tale, yeah. so everyone else is. Yeah. So it is, a, you know, there is a slight bit of what about about that. I will concede that, but at the end of the day, he's a bit of a hypocrite talking about fairy tales when he's helping spin one. Exactly. Fiction. Yeah. And secondly, um, it's a miracle that that didn't take about what he's just said didn't take about four days for him to say, isn't it, really? Yeah, because usually that's how long it takes him to say something. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Martinez. Um, I'm not sure where defense counsel gets the legal authority or the clairvoyance to know what the jurors are um, thinking or what they're seeing. Uh, again, it appears that defense counsel is much more preoccupied with the news and what is being broadcast than actually listening to what the jurors are saying. Um, it, 
problematic to say that the jurors are lying, which is what he's saying, when he has nothing to back it up. The jurors have been on numerous occasions, I don't know how many, been asked whether or not they are subjected to any media coverage, and they have all answered uniformly that they have not. There is no reason to believe that the jurors are watching anything uh, if they say that they are not. And it's abs- he's absolutely right. I mean, they took the admonition, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Um, maybe those jurors are going home and if there's something on the case, they go in the kitchen or they go in the bedroom or they do what they can to avoid it. Maybe some of them have integrity and want to do an honest job. You, you, how does Nermi know? Nermi doesn't know. He's just assuming it. Yeah. And I think he, he he lost a lot of points with the public when he tried to kind of, you know, question the integrity of the jury. I mean, as an attorney, that... You don't do that, do you? It's well, not no, wise. I mean, you can't say what the jury is thinking or seeing. No, no. I mean, there are some honest jurors out there. There are, yeah. And for all we know, all of these jurors were honest. Exactly. So, you know, major black mark against him, this, wasn't it? Of course. So I would ask that the court deny defendant's request to sequester the jury. It's a motion for reconsideration under Rule 16. I don't see that anything has changed. The jurors have indicated that they will abide by the court's uh, instruction, and that's what we have to rely on. Um, We can, of course, um, fictionalize what we believe that they are seeing or not seeing. (coughs) They have indicated that they are not seeing anything. We can question them again when they come into open court, and uh, I believe that that takes care of the matter. Before the judge speaks, I think the defence are doing this purely out of desperation. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're grasping at straws. And this is a straw that suddenly popped up that they thought, oh, that's convenient. Let's try that. (laughs) It's not going to work. No, it doesn't work. Um, They don't get sequestered. And like I said, like you said, you're absolutely on the nose. They're desperate. Right, the court has repeatedly admonished the jury to avoid media coverage during the trial. I have inquired on a regular basis to determine if any juror has seen or heard anything about this case in the media. I have inquired in the courtroom and I have inquired of the jurors one-on-one in chambers with the parties present. There is no indication whatsoever that any juror has failed to follow the court's admonition or has seen even inadvertently any media coverage of this case. Thanks! Love you! Based upon the law in this state, I am denying the request to sequester the jury at this time. And there was much rejoicing. As authority for this court's decision, I am citing State versus Shad, S C H A D, 129 Arizona 557, State versus Atwood, 171 Arizona 632, State versus Bible, 175 Arizona 574, and State versus Tyson, 129 Arizona 551. Right. With regard to the motion for mistrial that we her testimony on last week. I understand that uh, the additional witness is available today. Mr. Nermi, did you want to call that witness at some point today? Your Honor, has the court reviewed exhibit number two? I have not, but I will over the noon hour. I thought you wanted to present it during the... I would like the court to review it and then have the uh, Miss Wong, the witness, the opportunity to uh, review it as well. Um, okay. Right now, uh, as a concern given that Miss Violet was ill and her schedule, um, I'm interested in moving forward with that. Certainly, um, if time can be made uh, elsewhere, uh, we can uh, pick that motion up. All right. Miss LaViolette, please come forward and take the stand. Let's bring in the jury. Please stand for the jury.
please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Excuse me, I forgot my glasses. Yes. Uh oh, Alice is having a Velma moment. I can't see shit without my fucking glasses. Ladies and gentlemen, while the witness is retrieving her eyeglasses, have any of you seen or heard anything about this case in the media since I last inquired? I see no hands. Has anyone attempted to speak with any of you about this case? I see no hands. Suck it, Kirke. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue. Good morning, Ms. Wilmot. Good morning, Ms. Wilmot. Uh, we've I'd like to talk to you about some text messages from March 22nd of 2008, okay? Sure. Well, excuse me while I dance around the bleeding maypole. Uh, I'm handing you uh, the mark of exhibit 440. Turn to page 63. And, and we're talking about the nature of their relationship and how uh, we've talked about how it's gone... Uh, from violent back to the loving respite, things like that. So when we look at the text messages from March 22nd of 2008, uh, do you see a text message there where Mr. Alexander, in his own words, is inviting Miss Arias over? Yes, I do. Okay, and, and in his own words, is he telling her to make, himself, make herself at home? Yes, he is. And... Uh, what does that say to you about the nature of their relationship at this point in March of 2008? Looks like a comfortable relationship where there's a lot of back and forth and, and they're able to, uh, that they're both uh, inviting one another to things and, and it's pretty, you know, during these periods, things are pretty okay. All right. Uh, could we take a break for a while? It appears my intelligence circuits have melted. And when somebody tells somebody, in your own experience, when somebody says, make yourself at home, does that mean that they're welcome to be there? Yes, it does. Okay. Are you aware of any other communications between Mr. Alexander and other women where he complained of having a stalker? Yes. And do you know specifically the women that he said that to? He um, said it specifically, I know, to a woman by the name of Reagan. He said it specifically to a woman by the name of Lisa. And at this point in their relationship, by March of 2008, have you seen any indications of any type of stalking from Jody to, Tra to Mr. Okay. Alexander? Lack of foundation, if we may approach, please. Okay, I pause this to speak about something else, but if you actually look at the right-hand corner, uh, the right-hand of the frame there, look at the smile on her face. It, I mean, the judge has just said overruled, so obviously it's gone in her favour. I just want her to savour that moment, that little moment that she's having there, because later on, they're going to get their asses handed to them, aren't they? Yeah, and that I can't wait for. Yeah, but like I, the, I just wanted to point that out, you know. Yeah, but that smile should be wiped off her face. Oh, it will be. It will be. It, by the time we, un, we understand, we haven't seen this, have we? As we keep saying, this is our first time through. But we understand by the end of this, that smile is wiped completely off her face and, and this testimony becomes a disaster, doesn't it? <laughs> can't wait for that. Uh, let's just... You know, we've got a little bit of choppy waters to go through before we get to the real storm. And uh, let's get there, yeah? Yeah. All right, Ms. Lila, and everything that you've reviewed, the text messages, the emails, the journal entries, and you've reviewed Mr. Uh, Alexander's journal entries as well, right? Yes, I have. And in reviewing all this information, did you ever see any type of indications of stalking activity from Miss Arias to Mr. Alexander? No, I didn't. At, uh, at this point in, in their relationship, does it appear that there's any type of uh, stalking going on? No, it doesn't. And do you base that on Mr. Alexander's own words when he talks about inviting her over? Objection leading back to foundation. What do you base that on? 
on the, on the nature of the relationship, on his willingness to have her over, um, on his, you know, connection with her, as well as her connection with him. All right. I've since found out, or we've both since found out in the comments, I should say, um, that Alice wasn't being completely truthful about uh, some of the testimony she's given about her patients and about the treatment that she's given and about um, some of the um, qualifications that she has. So I no longer take anything she says as, you know, with any credibility. No, she lost all that. Yeah, absolutely. Um and I believe that will come out pretty soon in one's testimony. But that's just what, you know, we've managed to glean from the comments, isn't it? Yeah, from the people who know this trial. Yeah, back to front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing we've got to remember is that, you know, no two situations are completely alike and every situation is unique. Maybe, you know, he was settling for her body, having sex with her, but he just couldn't handle the fact that she was following him around all the time, sneaking into his house. Well, no, because he's got no freedom. Yeah. So maybe he was getting, you know, some sweetness in his physical relations with her, but some absolute toxic behavior with her stalking and her obsessive behavior of him. It's behavior that really is a 30 year old guy he should have known better than to feed but i'm not making judgments on him all i'm saying is he was young he still had you know bit to learn 30 years old isn't you know really a time where you develop a lot of wisdom you develop some but a lot not a lot do you no maybe he had a lot to work learn when it came comes to relationships and women but we can't really blame him for that Everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, and you can only learn by your mistakes. Yeah, but maybe he had two conflicting, two colliding worlds that he was finding it hard to... He couldn't resist her body and her willingness to put out for him, but he couldn't handle the fact that she was just being a, an obsessive, stalking, psycho swamp donkey with him. Yeah, but I think by near the end, it was getting a bit too much. Too much for him, yeah, I agree. Do we have, in, in late March of 2008, there are a number of text messages between Mr. Alexander and, and Miss Arias, is that right? Yes. And do you see a continuation in those text messages? And let me know if you need to review them, but do you see a continuation of this relationship of a general, natural type relationship between the two of them? Yes. Yes. Is there a point in time when uh, Mr. Alexander uh, tells Miss Arias to empty her voicemail because he's been trying to get a hold of her for a week? Yes, there is. Does he ever, he based, on, based on the text message, it, it, is this in a text message to her? I get the text messages and the IMs, I, you know. Mixed up. It's, it's, it's down on paper. Okay. How the fuck can you grin? Uh, when he does this, is is in your opinion is he nice about it or is more of an order from him he basically tells her to empty it out so based on what you've read of his own words does it seem to be more of an order or is he asking nicely because out of concern it seems like he's approach please so, based on Mr. Alexander's words in that in that written communication, did you consider, based on your experience in dealing with uh, men who have controlling issues or jealousy issues, do you, how did you take uh, how did you take that message from him to Miss Arias about her voicemail? That um, he was upset that her voicemail was full. He hadn't been able to get in touch with her for a week through voicemail, and then he told her to empty it out. Sustained. 
Maybe he was trying to get in touch with her to tell her to stop being a bloody nuisance, but that never occurs to bloody old bunny face there, does it? No, but then again, it never does. All right, so you, you got, your impression was that he was upset about her voicemail being full? Yes. All right, and did, and did you get the impression that he told her to empty it? Yes. Meeting. Hearsay. Trying to prevent Question sustained. All right. You're a disgrace. What was the impression then about how he told her to do it? What was your impression about how he told her to do it? Ordering her to do it. All right. At the end of March in 2008, did you also review uh, a written communication between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Chriselle? Yes. And during this communication, is this, um, well, Chriselle was another woman that he was communicating with, is that right? Yes, she okay. was. And in this communication, what was the overall subject matter of this communication? It was uh, graphically sexual. Um, but also, um, um, the impression was that she was a vulnerable woman, that she was married, she was... Based on what she writes in her emails back to him, did you get an impression that she was uh, about her? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. And what was your impression of her? That she was emotionally... Foundation here, sir. Sustained. I think Jennifer's latitude has run out. Yeah, I mean, she was all smiles when the judge was overruling, and now she's sustaining. The white smiles have been wiped off both the faces. Yeah. And look at Wan. I know. He just looks so cool. Yeah, cool, calm, and collected. Do you know something? Something's occurred to me today. It was while I was out having a walk. There's two reasons why Alice should be deathly afraid of Jodie. Firstly, because she's a murderer. Yeah. And secondly, Alice has got a face like a bunny, and Jodie's a bunny boiler. Yeah. There you go. Been thinking that. Yeah. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes perfect sense. Did we approach? Yes. Sustained. There you go. Further evidence. Look at that look she's got in her eyes there. Yeah. If you, if you screw this up, you're going in a vat of boiling water tonight, love. All right, Miss Leviolet, in this particular email with this woman named Chriselle, you said that it was of a very graphic sexual nature? Yes, it was. Okay. And this was at the end of, of March of 2008? Yes, it was. Fifteen shit impersonations of a Christmas tree later. Just may I approach the witness? Yes. I'm handing you Miss LaViolette what's been marked in Exhibit 594. Do you recognize this as uh, a journal entry from Mr. Alexander's journal? Yes. Okay, so this is something that, based on it coming from his journal, you would understand it was something he wrote? Yes. I, and we're looking at uh, March 27th of 2008. Yes. In this particular journal entry is Mr. Alexander talking about the move that uh, Jody is making back to California. Yes, he is. And is he talking, what is the subject matter of this? He's talking about the move. Objection, hearsay. Overruled. The move is something that will be good for both of them, that discipline is hard and that he will miss her, but that the move will be good for both of them in terms of um, him wanting to get married and, and move on, and both of them in terms of a sexual sense, I, I believe. Let's face it, when he said he missed her in that journal, what he meant was the only thing he missed would be a shit pipe. Yeah, that's true. But uh, he talks about their lack of discipline a little bit. Okay. Uh, does he talk about it, himself needing more discipline? Yes. Okay. 
presumably not to fall for any more swamp donkeys. All right, and March 30th, so, so just a few days away from this journal entry, and, and just so we are clear on where we're at in the relationship, by late March, Mr. Alexander obviously knows because uh, Jody has told him that she is moving home, back to California. Yes. And on March 30th of 2008, uh, was there a, an argument over text messages? I, I mean, not, not about text messages. Did they have an argument that you can read about through text messages between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? Yes. All right, and was that, what was the, what was the uh, subject matter of the argument? Five trips to the doggy door later. There was um, a, a text message late in the evening from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arias, and um, she was half asleep, didn't respond really well. I, I, may we approach? We know exactly what the translation for that, for the most of her approaches is, don't we? Yeah, we do. Jenny doesn't like the way things are going, so she's going to throw a little tantrum at the judge. Yeah, throw her toys out the pram. Yeah, bugger off. All right, we were talking about the text messages on March, or yes, March 30th of 2008. Yes. Was there an, from reading your review of the, these text messages, was there an argument going on between Mr. Alexander and Jody? Yes, there was. All right, and in this argument, in this argument, is Mr. Alexander upset because Miss Aries hung up on him? Y yes, he is. Overruled. Yes, he is. And does she explain that she's upset with him that she hung up because he was swearing at her? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. You're going to repeat it. The question is, is does, does, um, does she explain that she, why she hung up because he was swearing at her? Overruled. Do you may answer. Yes. The question is, why was he swearing at her? And whether Juan will address this later. Well, I'm sure Juan will address this later if there's no evidence to it anyway. Yeah, but he was swearing at her for a reason. I'd like to know what that is. I'm sure it's because she was creating some problems and drama with him. No, no doubt, no doubt. And this is... And this, these text messages, uh, when they're arguing with each other over these text messages. Oh, come on! Lasts about 35, 40 minutes? Yes. Okay. The fact that Miss Arias was able to hang up on Mr. Alexander for, after swearing at her, does that speak to her ability to start to have some boundaries? Yes. Okay. Yes. And is that, um, is that further evidence of her, of her pulling away from him? Yes. When she, when she establishes boundaries, it's because she's being able to distance. Hanging up on Travis was probably the least harmful thing she did to him. Okay, and just because we're talking about her establishing a ba being able to establish a boundary or being able to, on this particular occasion, not tolerate his swearing, does that mean she's completely out of the relationship? No, not at all. All right, and this is something that you see in your practice and your expertise with battered women that they can um, have a moment where they're able to stand up to the abuser and then they go right back to them? Yes, they do. Yeah, but they usually live together, not 1,500 miles apart, do they? Yeah, that's true. This thing isn't the same. Not the same at all.
On April 1st, right after this argument that they have, on March 30th, does Mr. Alexander, in his own words, well, does he text, does he send a text to Ms. Arias about how much he's going to miss her? And the timing on that text, if you need to find it, is April 1st at 545. Yes. Yes, he does. And in that text message is, uh, from your impression from that text message, based on what he says in there, is he apologetic? He's apologetic and says she's a fantastic person. As we said last episode, trying to make her feel good and trying to part on a positive note. Yeah, that's all. I mean, he probably didn't want to part on bad terms. If she read more into it than he intended, that's her problem. Well, she always reads more into it. Yeah, swamp donkey. Um, I'm sorry, what did you say? He's apologetic and he says she's a fantastic person. All right, as we move into April of 2008, this is the the month that Miss Arias leaves. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, was there something else that was important to you about the April 1st text? I think what was really important about the April 1st text was him saying that, or or the impression is that if he had treated her half as well as she deserved, they would have never had an argument. Well, it was April Fool's Day. Okay. So, and, and when I asked you about apologetic, is that, is that where you're getting that from? I'm getting the apology from that, yes. All right. Uh, and it, it, do you see uh, abusive men in your groups? Do you see them doing this type of thing where they start to blame themselves or they're taking on blame for how the relationship is? Piss off. It it depends on the person, but uh, many of them certainly feel remorse. They certainly are sorry. It's more the ability to go forward with that. It's more the ability to continue to act on being sorry. And for many of the folks that I've worked with, it's sort of the world as it affects me kind of remorse. It's, I feel bad, you might leave, or uh, you might have a bad impression of me, so I'm going to do what it takes to sort of win you back. But over time, there's a development of genuine remorse. You have to be able to look at yourself before you can do that. Okay. Is that something that in order to get the men in your group, is that something that you're attempting to get them to that point where they're able to look at it in an honest uh, way? Yes, and you, you have to feel good enough about yourself to look at yourself honestly. So they have to be in the program long enough. And it depends on where they start because everybody starts at a different place, so it depends on how far somebody has to go before they're able to look at themselves. I mean, some people begin to look at themselves relatively rapidly, and other people it takes them a lot longer. Okay. All right, I want to talk about in April, uh, there's a fourth uh, violent incident. Is that right? Yes, there is. No. Okay, and in, in that particular incident, did you speak to Jody about it? Yes, I did. And what is it that you learned that happened that's important to you? There was an argument about uh, her being interested in two other men. And when she talked about that, which was elicited from a conversation that they had, not just volunteered, but elicited, um, when that happened, uh, Mr. Alexander got very angry and he threw her down, straddled her, and choked her. Again, no proof, just the word of a murderer. Yeah, just hearsay. And being trumpeted loud from the rooftops by someone who is supposed to be on the side of victims. It's Disgusting. Old. It's a load of crap. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of how, how severe the choking was? She lost consciousness. And she woke up coughing a little while later. All right. What does choking mean to you? I know yesterday we talked about the conflict tactic scale. 
did, wh wh where, where is choking? Choking's um, on the severe end, and for many of the women I work with, they don't get choked. Choking is very personal, it's very close up, um, and it's, you know, life-threatening. So it's, it's a very serious form of abuse from my perspective. I bet the only choking that Travis ever did was his own chicken, and that was it. Yeah, or on a chicken bone or something. What the fuck? Does it speak, do you see any type of an escalation when we talk about the physical violence that's happening in 2008 and the emotional uh, abuse that's happening in 2008? Do you see escalation? I see escalation. Uh, we're talking about uh, just about a month's difference. Uh, we went from October to January, January to March. Now it's March to April. And the verbal abuse is starting to escalate as well. At the same time? Right. Based on the text messages and the other print messages that I've read. Okay. When speaking to Jody about what happened on this particular day, did she talk to you about whether or not she tried to... Um, defend herself against him? She said she started to defend herself, but she was afraid she would hurt him, and she stopped. What? That is a load of crap. If your life is in danger and you're being hurt, you are going to defend yourself. Seriously? <laughs> what planet is she on? I am completely lost for words here. That That is just... That is just... Dueling banjo stupidity, isn't it? That's just a load of hogwash. It's just a marshmallow mind. Is that is that inconsistent with women that you've talked to before about battered women that you've other battered women that you speak to, spoke to before? No, it's uh, not inconsistent. When I've taken self defense classes and women don't even want to hit somebody, it's the the experience of physical contact. For our, our contact sports and and you know fighting in the playground or whatever, most women don't have that kind of experience. Um, there are women that do definitely, but but most women don't have that kind of experience, and so uh, they're uncomfortable with it, and and for many uncomfortable about hurting somebody else. So we're expected to believe that this swamp donkey marshmallow hagress is some sort of meek librarian, timid little kitten who, um, you know, stabbing him 27 times, shooting him in the head and then cutting his throat is, you know, completely a wild experience for her rubbish. Yeah. Uh, she, I'm sure she was violent with him from the get-go. She had to be. Yeah. It, it, it's falling apart, isn't it, this? Completely. <laughs> we can see the holes. We can see through the holes, can't we, in this? It's painful. So at this point, so she says that she she did she ended up not wanting to hurt him, and that was her reasoning. Yes. All right. And did she also lose consciousness? Yes. What about minimizing? When you speak to Jody about some of these incidents, especially the physical incidents, any I guess to the emotional abuse, do you see any minimizing that's going on? Depends if she's got a window open. I see a fair amount of minimizing that's going on. Um, and, and before you go on with that, uh, specifically with Jody, can you talk to us about what minimizing is? Minimizing is just taking an incident and making it less important or less significant than it than it w might be to somebody else. That you know, an outsider might look at it and see it as as a bigger thing than the person who's describing it. And do battered have you in your experience? Do battered women minimize? the abuse that they've taken. Many of battered women minimize the abuse that they were taken, that and, has and in, happened. And your experience, why do they do that? Well, a number of reasons. One is that um, it's hard to take in something that is very painful to you. Um, it's easier to sort of uh, make it less than it is. The other thing is that with the gradual nature, the gradual escalation of domestic violence, uh, what used to be a uh, a misdemeanor, or what used to be a crime, is a misdemeanor. So that, so that, for instance, um, maybe I said to myself, nobody will ever lay a hand on me, and then somebody lays a hand on me, and 
that's part of what happens, or nobody will ever call me this kind of a name, and they call me this kind of a name, and that's happening, and I'm not ready to leave that relationship, and I'm tied in for all those other reasons, then I learn that that's just the way somebody is, and maybe they're going to do that, but they're not going to go any further until they go further. So that's part of the gradual nature for most of these cases is, is one of the other reasons that people minimize. Okay. Have you seen battered women minimize uh, the abuser's actions in an effort to, to protect the abuser's reputation? Absolutely. Okay. Or not talk about it at all. Or not talk about it at all. And we talked about that yesterday, about it's co how common it is to not report, not call the doctor, not call the police, right? Yes. Specifically with Jody, and speaking with Jody, did you detect minimization from her? Yes, from the very first time that I interviewed her. Um, she really didn't talk about uh, the domestic violence uh, very much. She didn't want to see herself as somebody who was abused, and she talked about it as isolated instances uh, without looking at the, the uh, sort of rapid escalation. What an absolute farce this is turning into, isn't it? It's turning into a bleeding circus now. There is... I, I really cannot stress this point, you know, strongly enough. She didn't live with him. She didn't have children with him. She didn't have any serious commitments to him or with him other than the Mormon church. And she wasn't even committed to that, was she? No, she was only doing it because of Travis. Yeah. If if he wasn't a Mormon, I can guarantee you now she would not have become one. No, absolutely not. She wouldn't have done. But it's a farce. That's the only way that I can describe this is it's just a farce. It has been ever since she took the bloody stand. What about the verbal abuse? Does she what is she does she minimize that? She minimizes it throughout the uh, IMs and the text messages as sort of she she moves on after a very, you know, what I would consider a very aggressive and demeaning um, argument, she moves on to uh, regular kinds of con conversation. And she calls it rude. Um, I would have other names for it. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let, let's talk about some of those times, because now we're in April, and, and you were talking about how April you start to see an escalation. Is that right? In, in violence? Yes. You saw my arse, Alice. That's what you fucking saw. Yeah. Well, I, I don't start to see it. I started to see it before, and, and I'm seeing more. Okay, so you're seeing more as we get to April. Yes. Okay. All right, on April 7th... All right, I'm looking at April 7th. Let me do this. And actually, this is an in evidence as Exhibit 444. So, do we see on the beginning of April 7th, when we're talking about where he's, he's asking her, where are you? You see that? Yes. And she answers in Hollister with a smiley face. Yes. And so do you see basically a normal conversation? Yes. And then we skip to a few hours later, and we see this long text message, right? Yes. And based on the fact that it's outgoing, that means it's coming from Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to zoom it in so we can see it. And so just prior, just hours prior to this text message, we have a normal conversation, right? Yes, we do. All right, and then he starts this with, do not call me and do not text me anything, right? Yes. And it appears that he wants information from her. Is that right? Yes. Did you speak to Miss Arias about what this tirade is about? Yes. Did you hear that tirade? Yeah, I heard. Both of these women are making no secret of their utter contempt for Travis and it's showing and it's starting to really oh yeah but I think she has a problem with men in general yeah. you know Violet I agree I think she hates men um, 
It's pretty clear, isn't it? Absolutely. And so do you have a background understanding of what Mr. Alexander wanted from her? Yes. What is that? He wanted the identity of a woman who had come to her restaurant and reported to her that Mr. Alexander had a, uh, a significant relationship with Lisa Andrews and wanted her to know about that. It's strange how this keeps happening to her, isn't it? It's strange how people keep coming up to her at work and telling her that the man she's going out with at the time is cheating on her. It, it's a recurring thing, isn't it? Yeah, these people who she claims she doesn't know, but they know her. Yeah, what? I know. It's God, it would be really funny if it wasn't so pathetic, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And was this significant relationship with Lisa Andrews during the time that he was also with Jody? Yes. Okay. And so in this particular text message, he's talking about um, her getting that information to him right away. Yes. And he's demanding that it, it takes 15 minutes and it and she won't take the 15 minutes to do that. Is that right? Yes. Right. Just look at her there. She looks as though she's high on something. She, she, her expression is just it's, vacant. Yeah. It's like she's just blank staring. Yeah, I mean, I know that, you know, David Lowe's video isn't the best quality, but well, you can you, still make out a face, can't you? And Her features and everything, yeah. Yeah, she is one weird witch. And he's, tell, he's accusing her of lying about it, isn't he? Yes. Um, and he starts to talk about that she better tell the truth or give me your imaginary friend with the worst BS story you have ever told. Or leave me alone. Yeah. Right? But yet, instead of leaving her alone, he continues in his tirade, doesn't he? Yes, he does. You need to shut the fuck up. He talks to her about how it's a lie like no other. It's freaking foolish, right? Yes. And there's no way out. You've screwed up your story so bad you can't mend it. Yes. And this is all he's talking about is the fact that a woman told her he was in another relationship at the same time he was in a relationship with Jody, right? Yes. No, what really happened was she went snooping on his text messages, his emails, his Facebook. She found out everything she wanted to know. She had all his passwords and everything. That's what happened. Of course it did. She never gave him his privacy. No. So this woman coming in and spouting all this crap, you know, a, a rerun of what happened with Bobby Juarez a few years before. That's, it's pathetic again, isn't it? It's just, it's just absolutely pathetic. It's just, she shouldn't even be there. Alice, no, absolutely not. She, she has no place on that stand. We keep saying that, but it's true. She shouldn't be there. And he's up from this, from this text message. Can you tell whether or not he seems upset about that? Seems very upset about it, very angry about it. All right. Now the anger then turns into threats, doesn't it? Yes, it does. He talks about you have till tomorrow to give me this person's information. And then he threatens her, right? Yes, he does. He threatens to tell the Hugheses, which we know at that point are his good friends. And in January of 2007, they loved Jody, right? Yes. To tell the Hugheses, to tell her friend Leslie Udy, and anyone else that matters about all the crazy things that you've done, right? Yes. Sounds like a man pushed to the limit to me. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think he was tipped over the edge there. Yeah, me too. And then he tells, he tells her to either fess up, right? Yes, to he To fess does. up or feel his wrath. Yes. And he tells her that no matter how bad the truth is, the pro he promises that the punishment will be worse than the lie. Is that right? Punishment will be better. Oh, I'm sorry. Punishment yeah. will be better than the lie. Yes. This is such a crock of shit. And again, he talks to her about truth. Nothing else from you until the truth, right? Yes. And then he ends that with, after tomorrow, it's going to get real bad for you. Time to spit it out. Yes. In this particular text message, he keeps accusing her of lying, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And he's accusing her of lying about information that is bad about him, right? Yes, it is. 
But in based on all your reading and review of the materials, was this true? That he was in a relationship with Lisa Ra Andrews at the same time he was in a relationship with Jody? Yes, sir. Is it true? Approach. I'm just wondering about the jury's perception of this. Um, are they thinking the same of, as us, that this is just ridiculous because they were not a couple who lived together, had no serious ties, had no children? I mean, she lived 1,500 miles away from him, you know, for some part of this. Yeah, so she wasn't always with him. Yeah, not just the perception on that, though, but the perception that we get that they are dancing all over Travis's grave. Do you think that they are aware that they're giving that vibe off, or do you think that um, think Wilmot, you know, has victory in her heart and can see, like, the, the finishing line in sight? I think those jurors are thinking the same thing. What is this woman talking about? Yeah. It, it occurs to me that quite more than a few of them are probably disgusted with what they're hearing and the way that it's being presented. Yeah, um, because it's just... It's a disaster. Just on a human level, I, I don't really know how anyone could sit through this and not feel any sort of revulsion towards what these two women are doing. I do feel it. Yeah. You may continue. Miss LaViolette, have you read through Miss Andrews' interviews and emails and written communications? Yes. Are you aware of when she had a relationship with Mr. Alexander? From... July of 07 through March of 08. And during that time, are you aware of whether or not Mr. Alexander was also in a relationship with Jody Arias? Yes, he was. Okay, so when... Friends with benefits is not a relationship, love. When Mr. Alexander is accusing Miss Arias of lying about in bad information about him. Right. That's what we're talking about in the text, right? Yes. That bad information is is actually something that happened, isn't it? Being in a relationship with two different women. The judge's speculation like foundation. She laid the foundation. Love world. Yes, in fact, Miss Andrews, he has a similar conversation with Miss Andrews in one of their communications where he's suggesting to Miss Andrews that if she listens to other people, she's going to get false information about him. Yeah, he was probably talking about Jodie. <laughs> he was talking about Jodie. Okay, so based on his communications with Miss Andrews, basically telling her not to believe things that she hears about him, right? Right. And now he's upset with Miss Arias for saying, I heard something bad about you. Yes. Yeah, but that's different. Travis was starting to see through her BS and she knew it. Yeah, and she was running out of excuses. Exactly. In this particular text message, is is there uh, is it important to you the way how long this text message is, or or how he words things to Jody in this text message? Well, there there are veiled threats in it, and I I mean the threats, uh, you know, are are sort of nondescript. Uh, some of them, but some of them are talking at, about telling people that she cares about. Um, I don't know. I don't know what crazy things he's talking about. I don't know if he's talking about the sexual things. I can't imagine that would be there because uh, that would include him. So I'm not certain what he's talking about. I, is it is the important part to you the fact that he's threatening to talk badly about her to her closest friends? It's that's one of the things, and then he talks about feeling the wrath, and I'm not sure. You know, your mind goes where your, your mind goes. So when someone would say that, um, and, and I've had people who I work with who make these non nondescript kind of threats, but they're threats, and they sort of uh, undermine somebody's basic security. If, if somebody you care about and somebody you love makes threats towards you, even if they are not specific, they still can be very undermining. Right, something else has just hit me while they're talking about threats. Now, if Travis was a violent person, wouldn't he have said in his text message, you either tell me the truth or I'm going to beat the living stuffing out of you or tear you limb from limb or whatever or something similar? He yeah, would I'll have, tear your bloody head off. Yeah, 
he if he was a violent person that would be his nature and he would quite possibly threaten violence although he could have been too smart to have not put that down on a text message but then again when you're hot-headed you tend to do things impulsively so exactly you do what he did was he threatened to tell other people about her talking crap yeah and then see where uh, or probably even the church yeah um have you noticed how they are offering absolutely no defense for what Travis is actually accusing her of? They're just focusing on his behavior and not actually trying to justify what the way she was behaving at the time as well. Because they're trying to just prove that it was all Travis yes. and not Joda. Exactly. So it's just so transparent and so easy to see through all of this, isn't it? It's evil. Yeah, absolutely evil. What about somebody who makes a threat of feel my wrath when he's already kicked her and broken her finger? Hey, back off. Well, that has, um, once again... The statement in the text message, not feel my wrath, it's feel the wrath. So when somebody says feel the wrath, well, and let me just double check. When somebody says feel the wrath, whether it's his wrath or the wrath, uh, does that make any difference to the person themselves, do you think? When somebody has been choked, when someone has been kicked, when they have broken, had their finger broken, when they have been slapped across the neck or the, uh, the face, by one person, and that person tells them, feel the wrath, what does that do? Is that abusive? I think it's abusive. But never forget, she just love, love, loves him. I think most battered women would think... Shut up! Is this something that battered women in general have to deal with? It depends on the, the level of abuse in the relationship, but... If someone makes a threat and you care about that someone and there's been a history of abusive behavior prior to that, it's going to have significant meaning to you. So in other words, when somebody who, who you love is saying these horrible things to you, do, is that more significant than someone you don't know? Is that what you mean? No, I'm saying because it has happened oh. and because you've seen it happen, then it has meaning. So in other words, it's just not a veiled threat. It's a veiled threat that's attached to reality. <laughs> okay, okay. Smile, though your heart is aching. All right, so at this point in time, do you continue to characterize this relationship as abusive? Yes. I'm showing you what's been in evidence as Exhibit 445. This is text messages between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias uh, on April 8th. So this is just the next day. And we start up top where he, he's talking about uh, her leaving something behind when she moved. Are you, did you speak to Ms. Arias about the context of these text messages? Yes. I. Um Yes, Mr. Alexander had uh, gotten a picture for her, and um, she wanted him to sign it, and he signed it, and then she forgot and left it when she was packing. She, she forgot to include that, and he was upset about it. All right, and that's, is that how this argument seems to start with him being upset that she left it? Yes. Behind? Yes. Yeah, I remember this. This was ages ago, wasn't it, that they covered this? Yeah, it's been a, a while now. Yeah, maybe he was upset because um, her leaving it indicated to him that it didn't mean very much to her. I think I remember saying that at the time. Yeah, so maybe he thought, well, she doesn't really think much of it, so... Yeah, so left it there. Yeah, a complete lack of respect. Yeah, that's probably why. That's probably why he reacted the way he did. Yeah. And he's talking about, he says, thanks a freaking lot for having me sign that drawing ink and then deciding you were going to leave it. 
If it's not one thing, it's another with you. Always drama, right? Yes. And her response is, hmm, it doesn't sound like it's me that's being dramatic, dear. Call ASAP. Right? Yes. So her response to his, uh, his text message is somewhat innocuous, right? I think what you mean, my little dear Yorkshire Terrier, is somewhat snarky. Yeah, exactly. Sustained. How do you take her response? I take it as, as um, her sort of coming back at him and saying, it's not me that's being dramatic, it's you. Okay. And he responds immediately with, well, he responds about 11 minutes later saying, do not call back. I'm sick of you playing stupid and dealing with childish tactics, right? Yes. And then he goes on for another text. No, no, no. Your follow-up question should have been, what childish tactics and what games? But yeah. no. Well, no, because the too much believe Jodie. Yeah, exactly. Talking about... It was a stupid-ass way of ruining yet another of mine. And does he talk about her ruining his days? Yes, he does. And he says, bitter feelings are brewing in me towards you, right? Yes. And he, he says he's going to have a genuine dislike for her. You're not the only one. If she keeps this behavior up. Is that the general idea? Yes. And the behavior that he's talking about is that she forgot a picture at his house when she moved. Yes. It's been so long since we covered this particular part, I can't remember. Was the context of this ever actually discussed? I mean, did I don't she... I think it was. I mean, did she say something like, you know, I'll always treasure this, I'll, you know, keep it with me all the time, and then she bloody leaves it there, you know? She could have said that. It could have been something as simple as that. Her Promise. Yeah, her promise and her professing, you know to keep it safe and to keep it you know it'd be tra she'd treasure it whatever and then she leaves it yeah for all we know that could have happened but you know i don't think the the they really want to delve into that too much but hopefully one does yeah let's hope yeah and he's asking her to stop it before he starts seeking revenge yes when he starts talking about revenge is that something that can be seen as a threat to someone who's already been kicked and choked and had broken and had a broken finger? Yes. Bloody fuck you, bloody. How do you take her response? She starts it with sorry. How do you how do you take her what do you make of it? Well, it's it's a pattern that she seems to have which is when he gets really upset, um, she apologizes for her behavior. And is that what she's doing in this conversation? Sounds like it to me. And she tells him, if you burn it, I'll understand. Just try to have a good day. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. Yes. So is there anything in here that she responds in a, in a, in a mean or a violent way back to him? No. And in response to her telling him to have a good day, he responds with another long text, is that right? Yes. He tells her that it was rude and inconsiderate for her to forget the picture, right? Yes, he, he goes on and on. Okay. And he goes on and on, Jesus. Alice, he is dead. Get that through your stupid head. You are talking about a dead man. A man that your client murdered. I think you said it all. If anyone is being rude and disrespectful, it's this witch. Of course it is, but then again, she's a man-hater. Does he talk about how he's trying to save his house? Yes. And that he doesn't believe that she's sorry. Yes, he doesn't believe she's sorry. When you pick cherries, the darker the red, the riper the fruit. And that if she was sorry, that uh, you wouldn't continue onward with this stuff. 
Yes. And, and again, this fight is about the fact that she left a picture, right? At yes. his house. Yes. And does he tell her that if he had done the same thing to her, she would cry for weeks? Yes, he does. Is that something that you've seen uh, common, uh, that people comment about Jody crying, being a crier? Yes. What, what have you seen? I've seen uh, Mr. Alexander uh, describe her as crying. In written communication? Oh. Overall. Oh, okay. In written communications, um, he has described her as a crier. Uh, and I believe it was Mr. McCartney. I'm not sure if it was Mr. McCartney. I think it was Mr. McCartney who also described her as a crier. Well, I'd call her a swamp donkey hose bastard who knows how to turn on the bloody waterworks. Yeah, when she wants to. A previous boyfriend of hers? Yes. Okay. That basically when she gets upset, she cries? Yes. And is that what Mr. Alexander is saying here? That she... Overruled. That you cry for weeks? Yes. And he talks about how he'll give her motivation to quit, to quit screwing with me, right? Yes. And again, is that something who has, that can be considered threatening for someone who's already been choked and kicked and had a broken finger and yes. slapped and hit? Yes. What a load of bollocks. Have you ever heard anything like it? After that long text to her, we see her response. And again, how do you take, what do you make of her response? That, well, a couple things. I think one thing is that, that she's apologizing again, um, and I think trying to de-escalate the situation. But um, she's also talking about distance is making, sort of uh, clears her head a little bit. Because at this point in time, she's, she's now away from him, right, in California? Yes, yes she is. All right, and is this something, This you said de-escalation? Yes. What does that mean that she's doing? It means that she's trying to calm the situation down, that when he gets upset and gets angry, that there are two things that seem to be consistent. One is, is um, you know, apologizing and being sorry, and the other is being sexual. All right, so here we see her responses that she talks about how good she feels that they're separated. Is that right? Well, she feels good, but she feels she thinks it's going to be better for both of them. Okay. These texts, do you think they're a, a plan of hers to kind of regroup and try and get him another way? Or do you think these are a genuine thing that she wanted to get away from him? Because I don't think there's any way she wanted to get away from him. There is no truth in them. I think what they're doing is picking little bits of certain bits of the text and trying to work it out in a way that where it makes look Travis look bad. Yeah. That's what I personally yeah, think. Yeah, just just basically cherry picking. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. But no, I think maybe this is some kind of way of her regrouping to think, okay, well, let's tell him this and then I'll find another way to get to him. Yeah. Um, such is her obsession. And does she tell him that she loves him? Yes, she does. And does she say nice things to him, that she's happy and thankful? Yes. This is why we can't have nice things, Barry. And then does she blame herself for leaving the picture to just chalk it up to one last ditzy thing? Yes. And then we see uh, a couple hours later, she writes him to thank him for calling to say that. That was very nice of you. You see that? Yes. You can't polish a tire. And then based on the rest of the text messages, does it seem that that tirade is over? Yes, it does. Did you review uh, Mr. Alexander's journal entry and I'm looking at April 8th which I think you already have it up there yes I do it was all stapled together yeah so on April 8th is he talking about Jody he's talking about um, Jody and Deanna 
Okay. And what's the what what is the subject matter of his own words in his journal? That he really wants to find someone that he can marry, and it will be a lot easier for him to do that now that Jody's moved and Deanna is going to move. Okay. Uh, and does he talk about being stressed for money? Yes, he does. He talks about. Um, Well, if she was as much of a financial drain on him as she was an emotional drain, then no pissing wonder, is there, really? No, there isn't, actually. And how's he feel about Lisa, Lisa Andrews? Well, he misses Lisa Andrews. But he's really talking about Mimi. Hearsay. Besides missing Lisa Andrews, what is he really talking about? Summary, Judge. Restate your question. Besides missing Lisa Andrews, we know you're not quoting, right? Yes. Okay, so the, what, is, what else is he talking about? What, what subject matter do you get out of this? Well, that he misses, uh, he misses Lisa and that he sort of feels like a fool for going after Mimi. Okay, so in this particular journal entry, he's talking about, I guess, some of the women problems that he's having? Yes. The key words that you won't find in his journal are, I miss Joda. And that he feels like an idiot. Okay. And this was from April 8th? Yes. So just close in time to when he just had this um, tirade with Jody through text. Yes. That word tirade, like I said before, starting to get to me now. Make no mistake, that is very, very carefully selected and used by her. She's using that absolutely on purpose. Of course she is. It's yeah. the only defense she's got. Despicable. All right, on April 19th of 2008, I'm talking about text messages. April 19th? April 19th. Uh-huh. And I just want to talk to you about the gist of what you get out of these particular messages from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arius. He, there's, there's a number of texts here, and um, basically... Mr. Alexander is offended because he feels that Miss Arius has insulted him um, about his speaking ability, and um, she's denying that. Um, he he goes through and uh, uh, talks about. I asked for the gist. He's he's talking about her painting. That is one big pile of shit. Um, she says that he's... She's providing the summary and she shouldn't be reading the exhibit. Ms. Dane. Do you sorry. need to... Do, you, do I need to review it? If you need to review it. Sure. Okay. All right. Do you see in, these, in the, these, this exchange between the two of them, do you see any evidence of him or indication of Mr. Alexander guilting her, guilting Miss Arias? Yes. About not helping him or not spending time with him? Yes. Well, boo... Fucking who? And in general, what is her response to that? That she. Whatever the exhibit number is in front of her. This This is a very long text message. Okay. Just so well, you know. In in general, when she responds to him, is she doing what she has done in the past, where she's trying to take it down a notch? Yes, she is. At this point in time, she's in California, right? Yes, she is. So why would a woman in this particular situation even respond when you're getting nasty text messages from somebody who's not even in the same state with you? Why, why is it that people respond to something like that? Well, they, 
started their relationship, the first eight months of it being in separate states. Um, but she's still attached to him. She still has feelings about him, uh, about the good parts of him that she really appreciates and cares about. And although she's got physical distance, she really doesn't have emotional distance. I mean, she has some emotional distance, but not enough to break it off. It's funny how some distance. Okay, and is this how we talk about how she's taking steps to distance herself, but she's not completely separated? Exactly. Is this something that you see in with other battered women that they do? Where they're, they may take steps to get away, but yet they, they're, they're not completely separating themselves. Yes, and it's, um, it's not uncommon at all for people to, to make multiple uh, breaks and go back. In fact, Lisa Andrews talks about that. She talks about um, their, their relationship. I'm sorry, you're sick. Sustained. What about what Ms. Andrews had talked about with Mr. Alexander? Do you know this from reading uh, emails of hers? Yes. And in, is the information that she talks about the way that she and Mr. Ale Alexander's relationship go back and forth, is that something that's important to you? Yes. In your ultimate consideration with the way that Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias went back and forth? Yes. Based on the your reading of her emails, what is the summary, what's the subject matter that you get from there that's important to your ultimate opinion? That every time they break up, and they break up through to this relationship. Approach. So what is it that, about the relationship between Lisa Andrews and Miss Alexander that is important to you, that you were just about to say? Mr. Alexander's ability to win women back, and and that Miss Andrews talks about every time that they break up, he addresses her concerns, and she feels connected to him again, and she says he can, uh, you know, he can always win her back. Every time they break up, I mean, she's trying to make it sound like Travis and Lisa were breaking up every bloody two minutes. I'm sure that was not the case. Yeah, she's trying to make out like it was like a Travis and Jody thing. Yeah, where it was nowhere near as psychotic. <laughs> Absolutely not. Basically is the essence of it. Okay, and is that something that you see uh, as a pattern with the relationship with Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander? Yes, I do. So is it surprising to you then that Miss Arias would respond to his text messages uh, or emails when she's in another state? No, it's not surprising to me. All right, and after the April 19th, 2008 uh, text message that we were just talking about, on April 20th, the very next day, does Mr. Alexander send Ms. Arias a very nice text message about talking about what he thinks of her? Yes, he actually does. He, he's talking about... The world. Go ahead. He's um, he's talking about going to a club. Are you giving us a summary of it? Yes. Okay. May she continue, Judge? Yes. He's, he goes to a club and um, he emails or texts um, Jody back and, and says that uh, he he really feels like she's one of the most beautiful women. Yes. Sustained. Now, I heard Juan try to object a couple of times during that, but this woman just does not know how to shut up, does she? No, she's yapping on and yapping on. It's really starting to get to me. Well, with the yapping, she's had a bloody good teacher and the woman who's bleeding questioning her, hasn't she? Yeah, that's true. Are you giving us a summary of what the text message is? Yes. Okay. May she continue, Judge? Why don't you restate the question? All right. On April 20th, do you, based on your reading of the text messages, do you know that Mr. Alexander is not with Miss Arias? Yes, I do. And do you know that he is in a club with presumably other women? Yes. And you know this based on what he's saying in his text message? Yes. And does he send a text message to uh, Miss Arias? Yes, he does. And in that text message, does he compare her with the other women he has seen? Yes, he does. Hearsay. 
overruled. Does he compare her to other women? Yes, he does. And does he compare her favorably? Yes, he does. In fact, does he compare her in a way that he talks about her inside beauty as well as her outside beauty? Yes, he does. Is it a very flattering text? It's a very flattering text. He was probably after a shag later, wasn't he? Yeah, that's usually the case with guys like that. Yeah, if you'd say something like that, as a red-blooded male, you know, I'd kind of think that would be the motive. Yeah. One shag later. And this is the just very next day after they argued, after they argued, right? Yes, it is. Okay, let's talk about, we're talking, we've been talking about what you've, what you, how you start to see the escalation in violence, both physical and emotional, right? Yes. And so now we're moving into some of the fights that they have um, in May, okay? okay? Mm-hmm. So, and, and when I'm talking about these fights, I mean, these are what we've discussed so far. Have you seen any, any fighting from Miss Arias in, in her response text messages? No, I haven't. And are these text messages, these rants that are coming, who are they coming from? They're coming from Mr. Alexander. To your knowledge, while this Harridan has been on the stand... Has she conceded that Jodie has actually ever done anything wrong? No, I think she's said that Joe. Well, from what I've heard so far, Jodie's been the good one, Travis has been the bad one. It appears to me that she's been giving evidence saying that nobody is actually perfect while trying to paint this particular defendant as absolutely perfect in every single way. Yeah, which is a load of crap. Yeah, and she can kiss my bloody bollocks, I'm sorry. Would you characterize what he has, uh, would you characterize these long text messages that we just went through, would, how would you characterize them? As tirades or rants. Whereas anyone with a working brain or at least an ounce of intelligence would know that they are just expressions of frustration by Travis at the way he has been treated. Yeah, and the stress that she was putting him through mentally, physically. Yeah. And he just lost it for a second. You will never hear any of that coming from these two witches' mouth. Never. Never. I'm just waiting for Wan to blow this out of the water. Yeah, come on, Wan. Take her down. Okay. And so, who are these tirades or rants coming from? They're coming from Mr. Alexander. And being sent to whom? To Miss Arias. Okay, so let's talk about uh, May 10th. And this is in, in evidence as Exhibit 448. All right, and actually just, are you aware that these times are not, are actually seven hours ahead? Yes, I don't get it, but I, I understand it. I don't get it, but I understand it. Huh? Huh? Okay. I've been told that. All right, so if this is military time at 2.41 in the morning, seven hours earlier would actually be May 9th. Do you agree? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so this one is incoming, meaning it's coming from Miss Arias. Is that right? Yes. Did you talk to Miss Arias about this group of text messages? Yes, I did. Uh, do you understand? Do you have an understanding then as to this first message, whether it was intended for Mr. Alexander or not? It actually was supposed to be sent to someone else, and um, it was accidentally sent to Mr. Alexander. Accidentally on purpose, of course. Okay. And after it was sent to Mr. Alexander, how is it that he responds? Is he upset? He seems to be very upset. All right. And we see him in the next text message, we see him accusing her of being a liar, right? Yes. And based on your understanding of and reading through these text messages, is he upset with her because she's having communications with another man. Yes. And she, and was she trying, was she telling him, telling him about this, these communications with another man? No, in fact, she was trying to keep it more to herself because he didn't want to know details of her life. So um, 
she's not completely she says she's not completely honest with him because he doesn't want to know details okay and that's you're talking about a text message down here when she's she miss Arias says that she was trying to move her business to a more private venue and that he uh, he brought it up and that she's a single girl and she's not she's a single girl talking to some guy and that there's nothing wrong with that is that the context yes and she talks about not being completely honest about him, uh, not being completely honest about this other person with Mr. Alexander is a mistake, isn't it? That's what she's saying. That, that I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, in other words, it, is she saying that by talking to Mr. Alexander about any interest she has in other men, is that a mistake for her to do? She feels that he does not want to know the details. Um, and does he get upset when, she, when he learns any details of her ever speaking with someone else? Yes. Have you noticed all you're hearing from him is, um, and does he get upset about this, and does he get upset about that, without actually going into why he's getting upset and why he's writing the words that he's writing? Yeah. They, they don't even actually read out the words that he has written. They just said that he gets upset and go, or goes on a tirade or something. Yeah, they're trying to make her out to be an angel, and it ain't working. These two, to me, are also villains, and I think that the jury is also starting to think of them both as villains as well. They are like the villains in a pantomime or in, a, in, in an old story. They might as well have moustaches and be twirling them right now. <laughs> yeah. And at this point in time, they're not supposed to be in a relationship anymore, right? True. Uh, and... How would you characterize his Mr. Alexander's behavior if he gets upset with Miss Arias for speaking with another man? Well, it's jealous behavior. Okay. And jealous behavior can be very controlling. And is that what you see in evidence of in these types of text messages? Yes, the further away she gets and the more she pulls away, I think the the more jealous and insecure he probably gets. And the more lack of context you give on these text messages, love, the more Juan Martinez is going to shove that context right where the moon shines very brightly. And, and that she, when he, when he reacts in that way, what I've seen is when someone who has had the power starts to lose it, it's a scary proposition for them. And they begin to react. If they're controlling, they begin to react in more controlling ways. Okay. I so see you're talking about uh, like a man. Uh, you're talking about Mr. Alexander. Yes. <laughs> and initially, we talked when they when they first met. We talked about the power differential and how Miss Arius looked up to him, right? Yes. And that and did you see a power differential? With, yes. In their relationship. Yes. Who had the power for most of their relationship? It appeared, well, Mr. Alexander did. Bollocks. Okay. And as she, as she is moving away from him and, and making this move away from him, uh, you were talking about losing power. Does that, does that mean he loses power over her? Yes. He, well, in, in losing, in her distancing, he doesn't have control. Okay. And when he doesn't have control, or when someone who tends to be jealous and more controlling loses control, it's, it's a scary thing for them to lose control. That's been my experience with the men I've worked with who are jealous. Not everybody's jealous that I work with. Oh, right. So when you say scary, is that talking about the emotion of fear? Yes. And what does fear... Is there anything dangerous about somebody being fearful? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Depends on how fearful they are, but fear is... Um, anger and rage are secondary emotions. So t to explain that, what do you mean? Um, anger is generally an emotion that covers up other emotions. If you had a, an iceberg and you had like anger at the top, underneath the iceberg, so you, anger would be at the tip, Underneath the iceberg might be fear, rejection, powerlessness, that kind of thing that escalates fear. Fear, you 
leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. When someone tends to be abusive. Okay, so when we see Jody pulling away from Mr. Alexander and the, these these tirades that he is doing through text messaging, is this evidence of his fear of, of, of losing her? It looks like that to me. You've got nothing to say, you little bitch. And then in this, partic in this particular tirade, about being upset about her speaking with somebody else, Again, her response, when we look at her response, is she, uh, how is her response in, in, what do you make of her response? She's apologetic in her response that, um, but also explaining that he doesn't want to know the details and that maybe it was a mistake not to give him the details, but when she gives him details, he stops her so she doesn't want to continue giving him details playing mind games with him, screwing with his head. Yeah, it's just a trick. Yeah. S saying that and then actually giving him the details. Yeah. Trying to get a reaction from him and getting the reaction that she wanted. I'm sure that when she got those angry texts from him, she was rubbing her hands with glee. Don't stop believing. Yeah, and with smiles yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she says that nothing she said was untrue. So when she gives him details, he stops her. But when she doesn't give him details, he accuses her of lying. Yes. Is that what is going on here? Yes. And then he launches into this text message where he's talking about this, this particular person, some man that she was just having a conversation with or a text, uh, texting with, right? Yes. What do you make of this particular text from Mr. Alexander? Well, he's, he's angry, he's, he's jealous, he's taking it to an extreme that um, there's no indication that that's going on, but that's where he's going with it. Um, he seems to blow up, you know, the, the saying, making a mountain out of a molehill. It seems like that, that's going on here. And uh, then he starts criticizing her. Making a mountain out of a molehill. He's calling her out on her BS. He's, he's, he's obviously saying to her, this character that you've pulled back from your marshmallow arse swamp does not exist, pal. You know what I mean? Yeah, she's pulling up all these new characters, but there's no evidence of them. Yeah, there's, these people don't exist. They never did. They're about, they're about as likely to walk into that courtroom as Tinky Winky, Dipsy, La La and Poe come in here to offer us some bloody tubby toast. <laughs> Which is what is pretty consistent in these messages. His criticism? Yes. And, she, and what, how do you take her response at the top here? Well, it's... Um, it's, there's some assertiveness there. There's some assertiveness about her saying, you know, don't ask me more questions, but also um, reassurance that she loves him. Yeah, and pretty soon, pretty soon, she's going to go and join a nunnery. Get the, to a nunnery. And she's going to take the vows, and she's going to be pure, and she's going to be really, really good, and she's going to make sure that she never murders anybody again in her life. Piss off, Alice. Reassurance that she still still cares about, and and advising that they they develop a don't ask don't tell kind of policy that they don't ask each other about their the intimate details or the or about their social lives about the people they're dating that they that they stop doing that. And his response to that is to forget each other even exist, right? Yes. And again, is he taking that to extremes? Seems like it. Yes. Okay, so down here, she had asked him to please stop, right? To please stop, um, stop the ranting, right? Yes, yes. 
And he responds to that, doesn't he? Yeah, he responds with more threats. Okay, and he tells her that she's going to start to be held accountable for your shiz. Yeah. Shiz is another word for a bad word, right? Yes. And he talks about how he's pissed, how she's pissed him off in ways that she never should have. Yes. That sounds about right, doesn't it? Absolutely, 100%. Yep, she's running true to form. Oh, yeah. And, and he tells her, too, that he's given her a lot of mercy, right? Yes. So basically the way he considers, based on that statement, the way he considers he's treated her so far, he's been merciful. One of the things we say, um, people who do a lot of work with perpetrators of domestic violence, is that they have perceptual problems. They seem to have a way of seeing things that a lot of other people wouldn't see. They wouldn't view them that way. Okay. And he talks about how times are fixing to get tough for her. Yeah. Is that another threat? Yes. And are you aware that in this text message, he, he wants the second half of, a, of the message, um, the message that was not intended for him was one of two parts, and he wants the second part, right? Yes. And so throughout this text message uh, tirade, he's, he's waiting for her to send the second part. Yes. Is that controlling behavior, wanting to have that second part to know what it said? Yes. Both of his apparel sausage shit houses. It's controlling behavior. And what does it say, the fact that, that Jody is trying to get him the second part of the text message? She's going to give it to him anyway when she's not even living in the same state. It says the same thing that the whole pattern has said, that she's not out of the relationship yet. Six hundred and forty-seven thousand eight hundred and twenty-one pages flipped by Dennis the Donut Boy later. And again, down here at the bottom, is she saying sorry? Yes, she is. And that she never meant, means to hurt him? Yes. And she talks about how she loves him? Yes. <laughs> and eventually, does Mr. Alexander apologize too? Yes, he does. That last message from Travis said, I'm sorry to, I love you. Probably roughly translated that meant, I like your ass, can I use it as a new Stetson? Yeah, but you'll never be my wife. Yeah. And if we look at the times, knowing that these aren't the accurate times, but I'm talking about the difference in times, we see that, that this whole thing started at 2.41, right? Yes. And it didn't end until 5.54. Yes. So three and a half hours about, well, three hours and 13 minutes about, right? Yes. Does that mean anything to you that, that this fighting or ranting from Mr. Alexander can last for three hours? At this point, um, it looks like um, he, he does most of the ranting. And to be able to keep your anger going for that long, um, that takes a lot of energy. Not everybody keeps their anger going that long. Lots of people will calm down prior to that. Uh, but he's able to keep it going. He's able to regenerate the energy and that anger uh, by the things that he says. And when you talk aggressively, uh, it's one of the things that a lot of the fellows in my group are working on is um, the way they talk to themselves, like with road rage or with anything else, that if they talk to themselves aggressively, they tend to feel more aggressive and get more aggressive. So they have to watch the kind of ways that they talk to themselves or talk to other people okay now regardless of the absolute insect crap that these two are spouting at the moment we tend to think of travis as kind of a placid individual don't we yeah yeah we don't think of him as a violent individual at all however having said that it would take a rage of you know, immeasurable proportions for somebody placid like that to keep 
a rage like that going on for so long, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I, so, don't, I don't know where they're getting this from. So while they're not asking the question, you know, what caused this rage, we certainly are, aren't we? Yeah, and I just hope that Martinez asks the same questions. Me too. Um, I'm sure that he will rebut a lot of this, and I'm sure that the real truth will come out. But, um, yeah, whenever they skim over, you know, they just say, oh, he was in a rage, but they don't explore why. I always ask myself why, and I know you do as well, don't you? Well, yeah. And I'm sure you guys listening do as well. Did you review, this is instant messaging, not text. You're looking at text. Oh, this is the text. <laughs> okay. Asking Alice whether that is in text or an IM is like asking a local village idiot whether what is in your mouth is a banana or the result of quantum physics. It's a banana. So we're talking about an instant message conversation that goes back and forth between the two of them. Yes. Uh, from May 10th. Are you aware of a conversation where they talk about somebody named Wayne Dyer? Yes. Do you know who Wayne Dyer is? Yes, Wayne Dyer is um, uh, a motivational speaker and he's considered kind of a spiritual guru as well. He's on PBS a lot and he's written a, a number of books. Okay, and are they having a conversation about, uh, about this person, this motivational speaker? Yes, they are. Are they talking in this conversation about how, how Mr. Dyer is making a joke out of the fact that he has a temper? They're talking about uh, Mr. Dyer's daughters teasing him about his temper. What has that got to do with it? And then from talking about Mr. Dyer's temper, about getting teased by his daughters about his temper, uh, does the conversation turn to Mr. Alexander's temper? Yes, it does. And does he, does Mr. Alexander in his own words talk about his temper? Yes, he does. And does he compare his temper to Mr. Dyer's? He does. He says his temper... Sustained. May we approach? Why does she have to throw a little Pac-mania tantrum whenever she gets sustained? Why does she have to go at high speed through the bloody maze gobbling all these pissing pills? She wants to try and prove she's better than Martinez oh at persuading God. the judge. It's so annoying. Sustained. You're on a may we approach. I just wish once she'd say, no, carry on. Just, you yeah. know, d do what you were trained to do in bloody law school and come up with some reasonable bloody questions. Instead of flying out of your ass all the time. Pair of bloody wank stands. All right, does, does Mr. Alexander, he compares his temper to Mr. Dyer, right? Yes, he does. And does he say that his temper is far worse? Yes. Overruled. Yes, he does. And... Not quoting him, but generally speaking, um, does he talk about how his temper um, if he were able to contain if he were able to uh look at that he's <laughs> like he's like, "Go on, I dare you, go on, oh God, he can't wait, can he?" I know, but I'm telling you, she is struggling. Yeah, she's struggling, but don't worry, he gets his chance very, very soon. Harness his temper, he would be unstoppable. Objection, meeting, question incorporates hearsay. Approach, please. Ms. LaViola, in your review of this case, did you... You've reviewed a instant message conversation between Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander on May 10th, right? Yes, I did. And I'm going to read it to you, and then I want you to tell me how it's important to you. All right. Okay. Where Miss Arias says, "There," and again, they're talking about Wayne Dyer. Right. This this uh, uh, motivational speaker. Yes. Miss Arias says, "He jokes about his daughters, tease him about losing his temper." 
And then she jokes, oh, who's the enlightened spiritual guru? Tra Mr. Alexander answers, yeah, I know, but they see him at his worst, and I promise my worst is worse. Travis goes on, Mr. Alexander goes on, so far. I've seen, and then Miss Arias says, I've seen your worst. We haven't walked in his shoes, but I take that bet. Can you see what they're doing here? They're twisting his words against him. Of course they are. I think even the most placid and, and you know, the most, um, you know, tranquil person in the world, if you push them far enough, they will go nuclear on you. They will unleash hell on you. Yeah, sometimes it takes time, you know, because anger takes, does take a time to build up. Yeah. And I'll, if someone pushes your buttons to, and pushes you past that limit, you're going to explode. Yeah. And I think everybody has really gone past, you know, the red zone, the, the, the red line, at oh, least yeah. once in their lives. Of course. So, and everybody kind of tends to overblow how bad they get, how, how bad they are. Um, so that could be, you know, Travis exaggerating. It could be him, you know, speaking his truth. But all we do know is that everybody runs past the red line at once, once, one stage in their lives, don't they? And it's bad. Yeah, they do. I don't care whether you're the Pope or whether you're Satan, you know. Everybody gets pissed off. It's going to happen. Yeah, it happens to everyone. So what they are doing is twisting his words against him, trying to make him out to be this really angry guy, this bitter, twisted, toxic guy when he was anything but. Exactly. That was all Joda. Yeah, all her. All projecting. Mr. Alexander says, ha, huh, yeah, if I could transmit that fury, I couldn't be stopped. To what? I didn't hear. He read the wrong word. Yeah, if I could transmit that fury, transmute. I couldn't be stopped. Transmute. I said transmute. She didn't. She said transmit. Yeah, she said transmit twice. Yeah. That's what it says. If we're talking about transmit versus transmute. Correct. I'm just reading what it says exactly. All right. Okay. And Mr. Alexander says, that shiz is scary. Yes. And Miss Arias says, you'll master it one day. Did you review this? Yes, I did. And is it important to you about Mr. Alexander talking about his temper? Yes, it's very important to me. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with are afraid of their own anger. They're afraid of how far it's gone. They're afraid of what they'll do with it. And they hope they can control it. Um, it's big energy. It's huge energy. It can make somebody feel very powerful to be that angry. But it is scary for them. And unless they get help, it continues to be scary for them. And is that what you see in reading this conversation between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? I see that, and I see that um, there is an exchange where they're both acknowledging his anger. She's acknowledging that she's seen it, and he's acknowledging that he has it. And I should, for the record, Judge, uh, this I'm reading from exhibit number 595. In another part of this conversation, did you review part of the conversation where Ms. Arias is talking about her self-esteem? Yes, but I'd need to review that. All right, Judge, may I approach? Yes. <coughs> I'm handing you exhibit, what's been marked as exhibit 595. <coughs> oh, okay. So is there another part of that conversation with when Ms. Arias is talking about her own self-esteem? Yes, she is. And is, is Mr. Alexander trying to make her feel better? Well, on and off, I mean, he, he tells her... Sustained. Can you summarize the conversation for us without uh, why you believe that Miss Arias is talking about her self-esteem? Well, she's talking about her self-esteem. She's talking about how she feels on the inside and how badly she feels on the inside and that she was the innocent porn star who now feels lousy about herself. <laughs> and 
And so does that give you insight, as, as of May 10th of 2008, does that give you insight to how Ms. Arias was feeling about herself from this relationship? Yes. Because in this, are they talking about their relationship? They're talking about the relationship. Faint. They're talking about the relationship? They're, yes? they're talking, yes, they are. Okay. Are they, are they talking about other things? They're talking about... Um, yes, sustained. What else are they talking about? In summary, of course. About their sexual relationship. Mr. Alexander is a, a well. Oh, she's already answered the question. She has not answered the question. Is Mr. Alexander comparing Ms. Arias with other women he's been with? Objection Question assumes. Overruled. Yes, he is. He's comparing her to uh, two or three other women. He's, he's basically saying that she has no uh, sexual equivalent except for maybe these other two women who are okay. But he basically says there's no sexual equivalent to her and that these other two women have been enjoyable and that there's a third woman who uh, he thinks uh, might have been, but he didn't get far enough along to see. I guess the fundamental difference between Jody and these two other women is Jody's backside was uh, open all hours and very much more accessible. Yeah, and these other women probably have had a bit more self-respect than she did. Infinitely more self-respect. And in that sense, is that is that his attempt to try and make her feel better about herself in a sexual way? I'm sorry, what was the objection? Speculation is he attempting. Sustained. All right, but we know that he was comparing her with other women. Yes. Do you know, based on this conversation, were these women before Miss Arius or after Miss Arius? They were before Miss Arius. Okay. The fact that he's comparing uh, women on a sexual basis, and he's talking about these women who were in his life prior to being with Miss Arius, does that speak to any type of deception from Mr. Alexander? Yes. In what way? Well, he continues to claim that he's a virgin um, to numbers of women that he, he has a uh, relationship with either by uh, virtue of text or I am or in person. And he continues to say he's a virgin. And apparently, prior to Miss Arias, he had sexual relationships with other women. I mean, it's not exactly the crime of the century. Oh, no, but... Um... Alice and Jenny would be slapping his legs if uh, he was in front of them now, because we all know how pure those two are. Pure as the bloody driven snow, aren't they? Oh, that's a bloody Luttler. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. In your review of this case, did you also listen to a tape recorded, uh, and basically what you would say is phone sex? Yes. And was that between Mr. Ari or Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? Yes, it was. As far as domestic violence is concerned, does this, does this, the fact that they were talking um, in May, and this tape was made in May of 2008, is that right? Yes. And the fact that they were talking in May of 2008 of this nature, does that mean anything to you? I'm, I'm not sure... Does it mean anything in, in relationship to domestic violence? Well, yes, in the sense, does it tell you anything about whether or not Miss Arias was completely separated from him? Well, it indicates that she wasn't okay. completely separated from him. All right, and is that, the, is that the indications that you're getting all along here, that she's making steps but not fully separated? Absolutely. Go and kiss your mother's behind. Did you review a journal writing from Miss Arias from May 22nd. Yes. 
But I need to see exactly what you're referring to. All right. Judge May approach. Yeah. This has been marked as Exhibit 591. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, now, May 22nd of 2008, is Miss Arias writing about a conversation she has with Mr. Alexander? Yes. And generally speaking, not quoting, what is the subject matter of their conversation that she's writing about? It's the conversation uh, that, that basically talking about the separation and that um, uh, it will be good for both of them. She talks about the laws of chastity and um, he gets upset, he gets offended, and tells her he already knows about the laws of chastity. Um, when she talks about the laws of chastity, is she trying to give him reasons why they shouldn't be physical, uh, good reasons why they shouldn't be physical anymore? Does she say, does she say specifically in her journal writing why she talks to him about the laws of chastity? She talks to him about the laws of Yes. Okay, then what does she say? Objection Generally hearsay. speaking. Objection hearsay. Approach, please. May continue. I'm sorry, but it sounds like there's someone rubbing their willy up and down a very loud microphone in there. Whoever it is, I hope that they stop it because it's becoming an arse ache. Yeah, or the sound guy needs to sort it out. Yeah, yeah, stick a tanner in it. All right, we were specifically looking at if she writes about a reason why she talks to Mr. Alexander about the laws of chastity. Yes. Okay, and does she give a reason? Yes, she okay, does. And what, what is that? Um, that it would help them not to be physical. She, doesn't, she thinks that they, their physical relationship needs to end, basically. Let's get physical, physical. Okay, is she trying to give him, like sweet talk him into reasons why they shouldn't be physical anymore. Yes, she is. And from him, you said he, he got upset. Yes. Does she talk about how things got worse after he just gets upset? Yes, she did. And how did they get worse? He um, wanted to know who she was seeing or if she was seeing... It's the same thing. Oh, overruled. Wanted to know uh, who she was seeing and basically if she was getting her kicks with someone else and um, those kind of questions. And Miss Arias indicated that she didn't freak out when... That she d oh, I'm sorry. No, I said go ahead. Oh, that she didn't freak out when he was seeing Mimi and that she had the right to see somebody else if she wanted to see somebody else, but um, that she wasn't getting her kicks or hadn't been with anybody else since Mr. Alexander. Do you know what? I'm sure she didn't freak out um, when he was seeing Mimi or said he was seeing Mimi in front of him. But I bet you in private it was a different matter. Oh, absolutely. Do you remember that scene in The Hand That Rocks the Cradle where Rebecca De Mornay goes into that, I can't remember if it's a nursery or not, but she starts like beating the hell out of something. That, I, I can see yeah. Jodie doing that. Yeah, I can actually. I can see her like opening um, a freezer, getting a big block of ice and like stabbing it with an ice pick. Yeah, and the murderous look in her eye. Yeah, the raisin, the the raisiny murderous look. Yeah. So when she talks about things getting worse, is it because based on her writings of the conversation that Mr. Alexander was was acting jealously? Yes. And was he? then accusatory w about her having another relationship. Yes. At this point in time, is Miss Arias able to actually say, it's okay if I were to have another relationship? Yes, she is. What does that mean to you? It means the cloth is torn a little more. It means that the, the relationship, she's able to assert herself more than she was before, but she's still not out of it. To be fair, imbalance, I mean, you know, they could be twisting this like they've been twisting everything else about Travis, right? Saying that he is jealous of Jody, basically, yeah. you know, trying to be with other men. But if that is true, it's not okay because at the end of the day, they, were, they weren't together. Um, he didn't own her. She didn't own him. There were no rings on each other's fingers. Um, and there were no ties. Yeah. Maybe he was jealous that another man was getting to 
you know, sample that booty, if you like, the same that he was. Maybe it was just a physical jealousy. Maybe he wasn't jealous of, like, her being in a relationship with someone. Maybe he thought, you know, good luck to you, mate. You can have her. But maybe what he craved, as we've said all along, is her body. Yeah, and and that's all it was to him. Yeah, so somebody else, you know, having a taste of that body maybe would make him jealous. You never know. Yeah, it's, it's always possible. But she's more assertive, she's more able to tell him, and she's more interested, it seems like, in, in moving on from the relationship. And the more that this cloth is torn, the more that she's able to speak her mind or be assertive with Mr. Alexander about her ability to talk to other men, what does that do? And, and I guess we can speak generally with abusive men. The more that they're partner is able to assert themselves or pull themselves away, what does that do to an abusive man? Well, there's more powerlessness involved in it. Than what, what happens when there's more powerlessness? There's more, there's generally speaking more anger and more rage because there's more fear when the person, as long as you have that power differential, you're able to, to feel in control. When you start losing that uh, power, you start to feel loss of control. We've seen Um, Tanisha and Samantha are in the courtroom today I can only imagine that they're listening to this and just you know wondering how little resemblance this bears to their brother the the man that they grew up with the man that you know the, the family member they've loved all their lives and I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes and trying to imagine you know because I'm guessing that they're sitting there thinking this is not our brother. I would be sitting there boiling with rage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that notwithstanding, it must have been so hard for them to just sit in that courtroom, especially during this portion of the trial. Yeah. And listen to these two people, you know, m- murder their brother all over again, because that's what they did. They, they, Jody may have killed him, but they really... Stuck the, 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 the knife through his heart, didn't they? These yeah, they're two, dragging his name through the mud. Yeah. I think that these two tried to really kill him. Um, and they'll probably just t- say to us, oh, we were doing our jobs. Nah, not with this level of detail, vitriol. No way. Exactly. I think there was a certain amount of personal satisfaction to at least one of the people on Jody's defence team when all this was going on. You can tell. Oh, yeah, of course you can. It's unrestrained, isn't it? Of course, yeah. I mean, to me, it's like a vendetta against uh, men. Yeah, against men, but um, with Travis as the face of every man. Exactly. But, yeah, a thinly, dis- very thinly disguised attack on every single person that walks around with a willy. Yeah. At the time. And when she talks about how she... Does she talk about the fact that he talks to her about his undying love for Mimi? Yes. And what are her feelings about that? She's okay with it. She seems... In her journal, she writes that she's fine with that, and she didn't freak out about it. What? Bullshit. (laughs) And when she talks to Mr. Alexander about it... How does he respond to such a thing? And if you need to review, that's fine. He apologizes to her. And does he tell her to leave his life, love life out of it? I'm looking at page 363. Basically, he says that um, he's frustrated because things aren't going well with Mimi. Twelve trips down Brown Street later. In this same writing, does she go on to talk about very positive things about Mr. Alexander? She says that. 
I know that you said she says, but are you going to summarize for us? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The the question. Does he say yes or no? Restate your question. It's shit. It isn't. It is. Totally is it? an utter shit. Does, does she talk about, um, in this, does she talk about him in a positive manner? Yes. And does she really, does she go on a bit about how much she cares for him? Or what she thinks of him? That's what I think he is. I need to review that. Sure. So does she speak positively about him? Yes, she does. Okay. And does she say that it's sad that they're agreeing to part ways amicably? Yes. But that it's something that's good for both of them? Yes. And in reading Mr. Alexander's journals, does he have that same opinion that it's good for both of them? Yes, he does. And Mr. Alexander's journals that we reviewed earlier, that was in uh, late March and early April where he's talking, or I'm sorry, it's uh, April, early April where he's talking about that it's good, it's probably good for them to part ways. Yes. But yet, even though they part ways, we saw through the text messages later on that he's still contacting her, right? Yes, he is. Foundation speculation as to who initiated contact. Sustained. We are going to take the noon recess at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Please be back in the designated area at 125. Remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice lunch. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. You may step down. Counsel, anything else before lunch? Several plates of green beans later. Thank you. Please be seated. Ms. LaViolette, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, juror number five is in the courtroom to observe as a member of the public. I want to remind you of the admonition. It continues to apply, and you should, you should have no contact with juror number five until the trial is over. You may continue. Thank you, Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you tell us what character assassination is? Yes, character assassination when you're dealing with domestic violence is deeper than name calling. It's really about tearing somebody's heart and soul apart. It's about taking a, apart their integrity. It's about pulling their character down. Um, it's more than name calling. It's, uh, it's more than just uh, a verbal sort of assault on somebody. It's, it's an assault on the character of that human being. And it's usually much more debilitating and uh, much more harmful to people. And when somebody engages in character assassination, well, do, is this something that you see from all of the men in your groups who, who have been abusive? No, it isn't. Um, character assassination, if you were looking at the, the continuum that uh, we showed the other day, character assassination doesn't occur with people in general who are low-level abusive. Um, when people are low-level abusive, they might call out a, a swear word at you, they might call you a name, but they don't spend the time to tear who you are apart. And that tends to be someone who's more uh, on a higher end of, if you're looking at a continuum of abuse, on a higher end of that continuum. I don't think what Travis was doing was character assassination at all. I think it was him trying to give Jody some some home truths. Yeah, for a I mean, for all the stress you put him through, yeah, she it's put him, no wonder. Put him through so much. So he was probably trying to tell her exactly what was on his mind, exactly what he thought of her. Um, you tend to do that with destructive people when, when they push you into, as we talked about before, a red zone, don't, don't you? Yeah, when they push you over that limit. Yeah, so I suspect that's what he was doing. Yeah, me too. 
Okay, and I'm showing you what's uh, in evidence as Exhibit 558. This was your continuum that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And we and we see, in the middle we see abuse, right? Right, right. And there we see name calling but not character assassination. Correct. Is that right? You see, some people will look at that and see a continuum of aggression and abuse. But I look at that and see the words by Alice LaViolette and think it's just a continuum of bollocks. No credibility. Exactly. Absolutely. So, character assassination takes it one step further? Yes, it does. At least one step, depending on the degree and depending on the context of other things that are happening. Okay. Is it a more severe form of abuse? Yes, it is. I guess the name calling. Yes. I want to talk to you about a uh, text conversation, a tirade, really. From May 26, 2008, okay? Yes. Stained. Have you reviewed the text messages between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias on May 26, 2008? Yes, I have. How would you characterize them? As a tirade, a rant. From whom? From Mr. Alexander to Miss Arias. Okay. Well, first, let's see. Let's. We'll start with. Three days later. And again, we know that the time is seven hours difference, but let's look at. Uh, the difference in time. We see it starts at five May 26 of 2008 at 321. You see that? Uh -huh. Is that a yes? Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry. And look how spearmint tits on the right over there is uh, sitting straight up, looking yeah. all perky. Yeah, looking all prim and proper, like butter wouldn't melt. Yeah. I don't know if something significant is coming up, but something's definitely got her standing to attention, hasn't it? Yeah, I wonder what that is. Do you have Do you have an understanding of what this conversation is about after speaking with Miss Arias? I remember that that um, she was talking to Mr. Alexander uh, about. No, 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 actually, I don't remember the context of it. Okay, all right. Let's go to this long text message right here, and this is outgoing, so in other words, it's coming from Mr. Alexander. Yes. And prior to this, we have the text messages where Miss Arias is trying to tell him something, and she's telling him that she doesn't want to leave it on his voicemail for him. Do you right. see that? Yes, I do. Okay but that she wants to tell him something. Do you see that? Yes, I do. All right. And then you see Mr. Alexander is responding that he sent a response to her dire conversation, and he hopes that she reads it because she needs to. Yes. And he goes on to say that maybe it will spark human emotion in you, something that only seems to exist when it comes to your own problems. Yes. The textbook definition of a narcissist. Yeah, T describes her to a T. Yeah, just going to say, textbook definition of Jodie Arias as well. And he continues um, that everyone else is just a part of her sick agenda. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then he talks about that she, how she makes a comment on a picture of someone else and that her comment makes her look like a pure whore. Yes. And you see where... He tells her that you should be embarrassed by her comment. Yes. And that if that person knew what Mr. Alexander knew about her, he'd spit in her face. Yes. Yeah, he probably would. And I won't blame him. I would as well. And he tells her that so would everyone else. Yes. And does he talk about how he's never been hurt so bad by someone? Yes but that she doesn't care because it doesn't serve her evilness. Yes. Do you see in this, in these text messages, are you starting to see anything like character assassination? Yes, indeed I am. Okay, can you tell us why this is character assassination versus name calling? Because he's talking uh, about her as less than human, because he's calling her a pure whore. Oh. 
Oh, yes. Or may, you look like a pure whore, which is like calling somebody a pure whore. He's talking about spitting, uh, people spitting in her face. He's calling her evil. None of which you would tell someone who had never done anything to you, who had, you know, if, if, who had acted pure as the driven snow as they say as she had. Why would he say those things to her? She must have done something. She must have said something or done something awful for him to say such horrible things to her. She stressed him out. She stalked him. Yeah. She's probably even scared him. They ain't even mentioning that. I know that one will bring it up, as we say, but they just gloss it. All they're saying is he called her names. He assassinated her character. They're not going into why. No, they won't because and they're there for her. They have nothing to back it up with. Nothing. It's, for them, it's like knitting fog, this is. Yeah. Plasting well. bloody sawdust, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's absolutely pathetic to watch. It would be pathetic to watch if it wasn't so heartbreaking for his family. Yeah. Those are things that are that are worse than just name calling? Yes, they, I, I think they're worse than just name calling. And because not only are they name calling, but they're all together. It's not like he's picked one thing to call her. It's like he's picking a group of things to tear apart her character. Okay. And he continues... To tell her that, oops, that she couldn't, she couldn't get off her lazy butt to read what he had written to her. Yes. And he calls her a sociopath. Uh, yes, he does. And he tells her that he doesn't want her apology. Yes. Did you see that? Yes. But he wants her to understand how evil he thinks she is. Yes. And he tells her that you are the worst thing that has ever happened to me. Do you see that? Yes. You know what you were saying before? I think it's having the same effect on the jury. I think the jury is sat there thinking, well, hold on. If he's supposed to have said all this, what did she do to him? Yeah. Why aren't they, say, why aren't they bringing that up? Yeah, I think, I think you're probably right. I think, you know, what they are, what, what um, Wilmot and LaViolette are trying to convey to the jury is how harsh he was. But I think the jury kind of, as you, as you said, as I said earlier on, thinking, well, why is he saying those things? What did she do to make him say those things? You don't say something like that unless you're really, really pissed at someone, you know. Exactly. And they've really pushed you way past your limit. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think that the jury are probably thinking this too. And then he continues. He continues to call her a sociopath. Yes! He does... And does he tell her that she only cries for herself? Yes. And that he thinks that she's never really cared about her, about him? Yes. And that she's betrayed him? Indeed. And we see her response, right? At the incoming right here? Yes. So after this long rant of continuous text messages from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arius with this character assassination, how do you, what do you make of her response? That she didn't see it, and that she hasn't seen it, and she would, uh, wants him to... You know, the expertise of it. Does she see, she's talking about that she doesn't have the email that he wanted her to see, right? Right. Is she responding in any kind of violent manner back to what, all the terrible things he just said? No. And is she in any way... Smiling to herself and seeing how much pain is in as she's reading it, definitely. Showing any type of anger towards him? No, she isn't. Is it your understanding that after this, these, this text message conversation, that the two of them, Mr. Alexander and Miss Arius, then moved on to uh, instant messaging? Yes. And have you reviewed that instant message? Yes, I have. It's rather long, right? It's very long. And actually, before, before we go to that, let me, again, with Exhibit 450, the beginning of the May 26 text starts, we look at the time, and we're just checking for time differences. It starts at 321. You see that? Yes. And we see it ends at 917. Right. So about six hours? Uh-huh. Is that yes? Yes. So six hours where 
this, Mr. Alexander is continuing with these, this character assassination. Yes. But it doesn't stop, right? Because then, have you read through these instant messages? Yes, I have. And with regard to the instant message conversation that they then continue to have, uh, does he continue with this character assassination? Yes, he continues with it. And is this something that you are now seeing that is, is worse than what you've seen before in his other tirades? Yes, there's an escalation. And an escalation of, of what? An escalation in the names that he calls her, um, an escalation in the in what appears to be the intensity, um, uh, and that he keeps going. He goes on longer. Uh, there are more names in that instant message. There are some worse names in that instant message. Right, well, Itchy and Scratchy up there are trying to say that you could have... Um an argument over IM text or email in real time, which is just ridiculous. Of course it is. Because I think I don't think there's one of us or one of you listening to this um, that hasn't had an argument that has lasted, well, at least a couple of hours over text or IM. Yeah, pos- yeah. It happens. So that isn't such an unusual thing. It takes time for people to formulate responses. It also, you know, people might be at work, people might be shopping, people might be doing whatever. You know, you, you can't do this thing in like an hour. If you're having an argument over text or I, I am, in real time, it's different if the person's there and you're talking to them. But not, you know, over the written word. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, because a lot of people get on with their lives. Yeah. And or they have kids to look after or they have jobs to go to. So not everyone can respond every two minutes. Yeah, and I don't know if, you know, there were long responses between this, but over I am, it, it takes time to type out a, a message. Exactly. So, you know, this isn't so unusual. It's not unusual. What about, you, you said that he keeps going. What does that mean to you? It takes a lot of energy to go on and on and on and keep that rage going. It's like an, an uncontrolled kind of rage. It's like a rage that just, just keeps feeding him, itself. And it would be very scary to be on the other side of that kind of rage, to be in the room with somebody who was going on like that. Uh, most of the people I work with, although they might name call, they usually are not going on at that level in terms of, of what they say to somebody and how long they say it. All right, what about if you have an argument that, in this particular, just talking about the text messages, if you have an argument that lasts five hours, is, is that unusual to have an argument lasting five hours? No, um, and in fact, they were younger at that time, and I think that most people can remember arguments they had in their 20s that are probably a lot different than the arg arguments they have when they're older, they have more life experience, maybe they take things a little less personally. Um, but when you're in your 20s and early 30s, um, a five-hour argument isn't that long an argument. It's, it's what's contained in the argument that's concerning to me. What she's concerned about only represents one side of the story. Not just the length of the argument. Okay, so, and when you talk about what's contained in the argument, what specifically do you mean? What, the the kind of language, the kind of um, derogation of somebody's character, um, the, the choice of words. Um, I have rarely heard words strung together in the way they are strung together in this instant message. Oh, I am so shocked. I could pull my own tits off. All right. Just may I approach? Okay. I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as Exhibit 275. Jackson doesn't indicate she doesn't call it and doesn't need it, have any for it. No question for her either. Sustained. Ms. Violet, have you reviewed uh, the instant message? I have Vincent. reviewed the instant message. And page wise, is it over five or six? Well, it's over six or seven pages? Yes, it's 16 pages. Okay. 
Is that something that you can remember without looking, or do you need help to look? Do you need help to, to do you need to review it to remember the exact words that are being said? I, I need to review it. Okay. When we talk about what's the, and we're talking about the character assassination that's going on in this particular instance, is it important to you uh, uh, what the specific words that Mr. Alexander is using? Yes. Six hours later. Do the specific words make a difference to you whether, the, whether or not you would consider them name calling versus character assassination? Yes, they do. The specific words are important. Okay. Based on that information, can you tell us, uh, give us an example of some of the character assassination that you see going on in this instant message? What a freaking whore. She's reading from the exhibit. May we approach? I'm going to ask you to do is not read from it, so if you want to look at it and then tell us, if, if you need to review it to remember what the words are and then tell us what it is, okay? Yes, uh, okay. I will. All right. Which leads us once again to ask, doesn't it, how many court cases has she worked? How many times has she been a witness? She should know this. Yeah, not only that, she should have everything she needs to say stored there in her head, for example, so she doesn't have to review anything. Yeah. I mean, I don't think much of Wilmot as an attorney, but at least she is giving her the right advice. We'll give you time to review it and then give us your impression of what you reviewed. She's reading. Yeah, because it, even if she's reviewing it, she's still reading it. Yeah. So... <laughs> Get a grip, Alice. What a complete clot. So can you give us another example of where you see character assassination? Um, and calling her a cheap whore. Okay, and another one? Uh, calling her a corrupted car carcass. <laughs> I don't know how a heart beats in such a corrupted carcass. And another one? Hitler had more of a conscience than you. And another one? I don't even know if you're... She's reading. Sustained. Ms. Bayad, are you reading or are you reviewing and then telling us? I'm reviewing and telling you. Okay, may she continue? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I've never dealt with a more solid form of evil. Uh, calling her evil... Objection. Did she review it? I'm asking she at least close it. Yes. Judge, I don't... May we approach? Just look at it. You may repeat what you've read. If it will refresh your recollection. All right. But, for the record, Judge, that's what she's doing. No, it isn't, you guys. Well, I just looked over and saw that she was looking down when she was speaking. Well, that shut her up, didn't it? Certainly bleeding did shut her right up. You may continue. He accuses her of being on to, uh, going on to the next dick. Another one? He, he tells her her words are worthless. He hates her. She's caused him more pain than the death of his father. She's a rotten lunatic. He's never dealt with a more solid form of evil. She's nothing but a liar. She lives a life identical to Satan. She's a three-hole wonder. Oh, yes. She ought to get tips for giving BJs. She never loved him. She's got a slut's job. Who freaking cares about you? You're worthless. You're a bitch. Your lives make your lives make your life worthless. You're taking up people's like air. Now that is very true. You don't care. You don't know what horror you've caused me. You're a laughing stock. You don't care about anything but Jody. He 
He blames her for a lot of the pain he feels in his own life. He tells her that he was nothing more than a dildo with a heartbeat to her. You're demented. Well, for someone who murdered someone so ferociously, she has to be demented. Goes on. Are there more Those, examples of character assassination? Um, some repeats of the same kinds of things. Um, some talking about her values, um, but basically more of the same and, and calling her some repeated names. But it goes on for 16 pages. Not all of them are name-calling, but they certainly are tearing her character apart. All right. And, it, and this is something, and I understand you're not familiar so much with the emails and which the difference between them, but you can tell that this is something that is being typed out between the parties, right? Yes. So every time Mr. Alexander wants to say something, he's going to be typing it? Yes. And you say in this, and our, when you talk about single, or when you talk about 16 pages, is this something that is single spaced? It is single spaced. It keeps cutting back to Jura number five there. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm not sure whether she was allowed to actually be interviewed by um, the media while this was going on. I dare say she wasn't allowed. Um, I think there were there are statutes in American law that prevent a, a juror an ex-juror from speaking to the media while the case is still ongoing. Yeah, that's true, I think. So she's effectively gagged, but she obviously has a vested interest in this case enough that she wants to attend. But I'm just not sure what's going on there. We've not sp spoiled that much for ourselves, have we? No, we haven't, so... We, we try and know. take everything as it comes. But we know that you guys in the comments will let us know what happened, you know, the likes of Sue Cavanaugh, Nova Scotia Skater, um, you know, let us know what happened with Juro number five. Um, we'd be interested to know, wouldn't we? Yes, yeah, pretty interesting. Very that. interesting. We talked about the length of the text message tirade being lasting over five hours. Do you have any idea of the length of this instant message conversation? I don't know when it started. No, I don't know how long. I just know that, that it's single space, 16 pages. What about pages. his mother with regard to verbal abuse? Objection, order, hearsay. I approach, counsel. Okay, Ms. Lilet. In reading the writings that, that Mr. Alexander wrote, yes. okay? Did, did he talk about having to suffer as a child from verbal abuse? Yes, he did. And did he talk about suffering as a child from verbal abuse at the hands of his own mother? Fuck off. Yes, he did. And did he talk about the severity of this verbal abuse by his mother? Yes. Yes, he did. Absolutely. And when we talk about severity, was it severe verbal abuse? It was very severe ver verbal abuse. Now, this is going low. This, this is going very, very low. This is going below the belt. Way below. Way below the belt and way below the knees. Yeah. I mean, bringing him, you know, his mother's verbal abuse into it, set, trying to, you know, say that he should know better. Christ. His mother wasn't dealing with a complete narcissistic psychopath. She was dealing with a little boy. Exactly. He had to deal with this complete swamp donkey nightmare. There's a difference. There's no comparison. And is that important to you in trying to then assess the relationship or his, what he's writing and saying to Miss Arias? Yes, there's a direct link when you look at role modeling and what you learn in families of origin. Um, in addition to that, um, the only consistent risk marker when you look at uh, people growing up or people who become perpetrators of domestic violence, the only consistent risk marker is that they have been exposed to domestic violence in their, it could be their family of origin or the family that raised them, but there's exposure to that because children learn uh, a lot from the people that raised them. Oh, so they've gone in that direction, have they? 
Oh, so he, he had a mother that insulted him, so it's typical behaviour. What absolute scumbags. Yeah, because some people do witness domestic violence growing up, but they don't necessarily become an abuser. Exactly, they don't. These two swamp tards are completely getting on my nerves. Yeah, they're doing my head in. Come on, one. And unless they get some type of help or counselling for that, is it difficult for them to learn another way? It's very difficult for them to learn another way. It's, you don't expect somebody who grows up um, in a Spanish-speaking family and that's monolingual to speak fluent English. And I don't expect somebody who grows up in an abusive family to just know how to, to speak the language of mental health without some help. Um, and that can come from other people, but uh, generally speaking, Almost 100% of the people that I work with have come from families where they were either direct recipients of, of abuse or they were exposed to it. In this particular um, instant messaging conversation, at some point, does Ms. Arias talk about, <clears throat> about um, the sexual contact that they've had over their relationship? Yes, she does. Do you need to review it? I basically know what she says. Okay. So depending on how depending on what you're referring to. I know some of the things she said. Okay. Well, if you need to refer, just refer to the exhibit. Let me know, okay? All right. All right. So, does she talk about why their sexual contact was important to her? What she got from it? Yes, she does. And generally speaking, what is it that she says? She basically says that for her, the sex made the relationship seem more special. Maybe she was blind to that, but that she made it made her feel more special, and that the more that she complied or went along with what he wanted to do, the more that they were sexual and the more satisfactory that sex was, the more he wanted her and the more time they had together, and the closer she felt. Oh, we're back to that. Her complying, her doing what he wants all the time, without any question, without any mind of her own. We're back to that. Yeah, want him to make him feel loved and special yeah and uh taking it up the backside is special to her each to their own i suppose yeah everyone likes their own i guess their own backside they do and so was she talking about the closeness that she enjoyed yes and the time that they would spend together yes in your practice and your experience is there a difference uh between men and women on how we view sex and love there's a, a saying that, um, and I don't mean to offend any of the men who don't feel this way. There's a saying that men give sex to get love, and women, or men give love to get sex, and women give sex to get love. And that's not always true, but um, sexuality um, means, tends to mean different things. And oftentimes for women, it's the cuddling, it's the kissing, it's the foreplay. Um, but oftentimes for men, it's the sexual act itself that encompasses that. Excrement. So there's, there's a different way of looking at sexuality, I think, in general. And in your practice, do, uh, have you found in your experience that men and women are judged differently based on their sexual activities? Yes. Um, men have notes. Women have families. Oftentimes when women are acting out in a sexual way, they're seen as sluts. There's a lot of names attached to that. Um, when men are acting out sexually, it's often seen as that they're more of a stud or th that it's a, it's a more positive thing than when women are acting out sexually. And I think that things have changed to some degree, but I think there's still that overall belief that uh, women who are acting out in a sexual way are seen more negatively. By society, you mean? By society in general, yeah. All right. After May 26th, which when we have these tirades, I wanted, there's some journal entries from Miss Arias. And have you reviewed the journal entries from May 26th to May 30th from Ms. Arias? Yes, I have. 
showing the exhibit 592. What's been marked is 592. And I know it starts with May 24th, and I wanted to. I turned the page to May 26th, okay? Uh huh. I All mean, right. yes. <laughs> All right. So on May 26th, we have writings from Miss Sirius, and this would be uh, around the same time that we. Uh, but we just read through these tirades that are happening, right? Yes. Aren't you just looking forward to when Juan turns these so-called tirades into justifications of anger? <laughs> I can't wait for that. That's what I'm hoping. Does Miss Arias talk about this communication that she just had with Mr. Alexander? Objection. Again, the witness hasn't indicated she doesn't remember. Restate your question. In the journal entry, does Miss Arias talk about uh, whether or not these communications that she just had with Mr. Alexander? Her recollection hasn't been, uh, doesn't need to be refreshed. Overall, you may answer. All right. Um, yes. Okay. She, <laughs> she does talk about it, um, and she calls it classic root. Sustained. All right, so what, when we're talking, we just read through all this character assassination and the terrible names that he uh, calls her. In her journal, she, does she write about it? Yes, she okay. does. All right, and when she writes about it in her journal, does she characterize or does she minimize what just happened? Yes, she does. And does she minimize uh, these conversations that she just had with Mr. Alexander in, in a way that basically... Uh, does she give it very much detail about it? She does to the time that these were written. One possible explanation for her lack of mentioning this particular text argument in her journal could be that she couldn't care less, that his pain, that his suffering meant nothing to her, and that's why she didn't elaborate on it. Because yeah. that's how much it meant. <laughs> well, that's her... It's the way she is. It's yeah. the way she feels. So it's her all over. It's yeah. the it's, the whole the whole world is there for Jodie Arias, and we're just bit players in her show, aren't we? Yeah, we're just there for the sake of it. We're her servers. May I help you? <coughs> does she give much detail? About no, she doesn't. She doesn't give detail. She just says classic rude. All right, so does she talk about then minimizing, in other words, she doesn't put any of these horrible names in her journal? She doesn't. And that's part of the promise from earlier. Is that part of the promise that she makes to Mr. Alexander earlier not to write about negative things about him? Yeah. Well, she didn't write it. Overall, to me, Yes, she's made a promise to him that she won't write specific things in her journal, and she's keeping that promise. Does she actually refer to these tirades as uh, one of the cycles? She talks about a pattern. Yes or no? It's not beyond the scope. O overall, do you mean answer? She talks about a pattern where he gets pissed off they, and then they make up. He goes off on her, he gets pissed off, he goes off on her. And then they make up. And so is she, is she talking, in, in the sense, are, is she getting a sense of this pattern? Does she understand that there's a pattern now? She does understand there's a pattern. And when she talks about this pattern, is, can you see an increase um, or an escalation in this pattern, how often it happens? Do I see an increase? Well, w what she writes about. Does she talk about timing of the pattern? And if you need to refresh your recollection, go ahead. She talks about things being melancholy. How does she talk about it as a pattern? She talks about it happening every few days. Okay. Probably because of something she did to him. And so... Or of every few days there's a good period of time and then there's another blow up. Okay. And 
so is that an escalation? It, it, are you seeing an escalation in the pattern of the, of the blow-ups and then back down? Yes. And are you seeing that, besides just looking at her journal, are you seeing that on your own through the text messages? I'm seeing that on my own through the text messages, and I'm seeing that on my own in regard to, to physical incidents as well. Okay. In this journal entry, does she compare Mr. Alexander to her own father? She does. And how, what is she, how does she compare the two? She compares them as um, similar in their athletic, athleticism, in their, their physiques, um, in their, uh, the, that they're both opinionated, that they're both Republican, and then she says, and they both make... The world. They both make uh, rude statements and then uh, find ways to make up for it. From personal experience, that last bit is just called being a man. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at page 377 in case you need to refresh. Does she talk about specific... Yeah, there's no reading. There isn't the question before her. I just directed her to page 377. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. So uh, does she, is there a point in this journal entry where she talks about their, their two-hour chat? Yes. And when she's talking about chatting, is she talking, uh, can you tell from the context of this entry, is she talking about this instant messaging chatting that she just did? It sounds like it. She says we had a two-hour chat, and I let him get it out of his system. All right. So, so does she then talk about uh, how she reacts to his tirades by letting her get it, him get it out of her system, his system? That's what she says, that she lets him get it out of his uh, system. And is that part of the pattern that she sees that she's talking about earlier? Yes. All right, I'm talking, uh, on May 27th, she has another journal entry, and I'm talking about page 379. Do you need to refresh your recollection? No, I, I know that. All right. Uh, is she talking about uh, meeting somebody named Ryan Burns? Yes, she is. And is she talking about taking a trip to go see him? She's talking about taking a trip to Utah to go see Ryan Burns. Is this evidence of her actual behavioral evidence of her moving on? Yes. And in her entry, does she sound excited about it? She says, great news. So she's excited. But they've texted each other. Yeah, but we know the real reason why that was great news for her, don't we? Yeah, she realised she had an alibi. Yeah, she realised it was the perfect excuse to uh, to carry out a plan. Exactly. All right, and and throughout her this journal entry, is she talking about making plans to uh, on this trip to go to Utah? Yes, she is. Thirty-two misuses of the world contemporaneously later. All right. In May, on May 30th, I'm on page 381. Let me know if you need to refresh your recollection. Yes. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm th I've recollected. Okay. Uh, uh, and as of May 30th, 2008, is she um, making a, a full plan now to go to Utah? Does she know when she's going? She's going the following week. Um, she's excited because she's going to spend a couple days with Ryan, but she's also hoping to hit some national parks along the way. You little shit park. And now on to June 1st, page 383. Is she just generally speaking about what her itinerary is? 
Yes, and she's talking about visiting um, Daryl, her ex-boyfriend, and Matt, her ex-boyfriend, and Daryl's uh, Daryl and his son Jack. She's looking at uh, forward to visiting them and saying she's definitely going to visit them. Definitely going to visit Matt. Well, after visiting all of them, her uh, arsehole's going to be gaping wide, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And incidentally, is she still friendly with both of her ex-boyfriends, uh, Mr. Brewer and Mr. McCartney? She is friendly with both of them. And later in this journal entry on June 1st, does she talk about, and I'm on page 385 if you need. Do you need to review that? Yes, I mean no. Okay. Sort your fucking life out, mate. All right, later in this journal entry on June 1st, is she talking about bringing up the trip to Utah to Mr. Alexander? Yes, she is. And that Mr. she and Mr. Alexander have a conversation about her trip to Utah? Yes, they do. And it, how did Mr. Alexander take the news that she was going to Utah? Um, she says he's not that thrilled about it. I didn't hear. Okay, I'm sorry, what did you say? She, she says he's not very thrilled about her taking the trip to Utah. That he's not thrilled? Is that that he's saying? not thrilled, yes. And of course, her putting it in the journal means it's the absolute truth, doesn't it? Yeah, she probably thinks it's gospel. I mean, why would this bloody pig-nosed swamp donkey ever lie to anyone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's so sweet and innocent. Yeah. Is she trying to, uh, does she want to tell him that she's going to see, visit another man? No, she doesn't. Uh, in fact, she's talked to the friend that introduced her and asked him not to say anything. To Mr. Uh, Alexander? Yes, not to say anything. She said she doesn't want to hurt Mr. Alexander. In other words, she didn't want him to know she was coming. And on page 389, let me know if you need to refresh. And this is, a, this is all part of the June 1st entry, right? Yes. Okay. Do, is she talking further about her conversation with Mr. Alexander? Yes, she is. And is Mr. Alexander guilting her about coming to see him? Yes. Never happened. If she did tell him she was coming, he'd probably made sure he was out that night, probably, unless she, you know, he really wanted to have sex with her. And does she, uh, does she talk about how she handles that? Yes, she does. Um, she says that she, she stood her ground, and she said if it wasn't for looking forward to seeing uh, Ryan Burns, that she might not have been able to stand her ground but that helped her to be able to stand her ground. And by stand her ground, she's doing what? By standing her ground, she's, she's saying that she's not going to, to Arizona. She's not going to Mesa. She's going to take the trip she had originally intended to take. Bullshit. Okay, so is she able to say no to Mr. Alexander? Yes, she is. And on page 390, does she talk about how he took that news? She says that... Um, he sounded bothered by it. Okay. And this was June 1st, is that right? Yes. Yeah, have you noticed how none of this is on text or IM or email? It's, it's a phone call for which wasn't recorded. We have no evidence. The only written record of it is her journal. Yeah. And she could put anything she want in that, wants in there. I mean, she's recorded some phone calls, so why didn't she record that one? Yeah, yeah. It's selective, isn't it? Yeah. She also reminded him he was going to be visiting her soon. Are you aware of the, the fact that they had plans that he was going to be coming up to California to visit her? Yes. And is that what she was reminding him of? Yes. And when she had the conversation with him about not being physical anymore, 
was part of was part of that conversation that they weren't going to be physical when he comes to see her in California? I believe they were going to be physical. I believe they had a plan to uh, to, to there be was physical. a place in the woods. Okay. That, right. Okay. So uh, is this something that you see then that she is continuing to struggle with? Yes. All right. And then just generally speaking, text messages between the two of them from May 30th to June 2nd. Are, are they just general conversation type text messages? Yeah, they're, they're very conversational. Okay. Nothing mean about them? No. Now, I want to talk to you about the timing of communications from Mr. Alexander to numerous other women, okay? All right. And I want to specifically just narrow it down to a timeline of around December 2007 up to June of 2008, okay? All right. Further sticking the boot into a dead man. I don't believe this. Yeah, it's like the trampling all over his grave. It's reprehensible. And it's not to say that there weren't communications with other women by Mr. Alexander prior to December of 7. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. But for our purposes, let's narrow it down. All right. Okay. Uh, have you reviewed communications between Mr. Alexander and, and other women during this time period? Yes, I have. And in your review of these communications, do you find them important to your assessment about the relationship between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? I find them important uh, regarding the deception. And, uh, and the deception by whom? By Mr. Mr. Alexander, the ongoing deception. Okay. I find them significant for, for those reasons. All right. For that reason. And do you find um, do you find it addressing any type of a um, a pattern in the way that he treats other women? Yes, I do. And when the communications that you reviewed between December and June, when do most of these communi communications take place as far as time of the day? They happen late at night, um, sometimes in the middle of the night. So they they tend to happen late in the evening. Okay, and and not all of them. Is that right? No, not all of them. But are you talking about most of them happen, most of the, his communications with other women are in the middle of the night? Yes, and in fact, some of the women complain about it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some of these. Uh, do you know a woman, or are you familiar with a woman named Denise? Yes. And did you review communications between Mr. Alexander and Denise? Yes, I did. Uh, what type of woman was Denise? The Judge Pearson, Foundation. Sustained. Well, Judge, may we approach? You may. May continue. All right, Ms. Lila, in reviewing your communications between Mr. Alexander and uh, this woman named Denise, does she, in your opinion, seem to be a, a in a vulnerable position? Yes. And that's based on some of the things that she says about herself? Yes, it is. And the communications with Mr. Alexander, is he... Uh, is he flirtatious with her? Yes. And does he make sexual innu innuendos? He asked for... Um, yes. Sustained. Yes. <laughs> you can wait for the judge to roll. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Your Honor. Because okay. I'm not fucking laughing. I get, I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about a woman named Nicole. Are you familiar with communications between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Nicole? Yes, I am. And... Did Mr. Was Nicole already in another relationship during these communications? Yes, she was. Overall, she may answer yes or no. Yes. And during some of these conversations, is Mr. Alexander insulting her about her relationship? Yes, yes, he is. In other conversations, is he being flirtatious with her? Yes, he has been flirtatious with her. One swamp donkey's insult is another man's breaking balls. And we've heard from uh, about a woman named Lisa that he was dating from 2007 to 2008, right? Yes. Did you review communications between them as well? Yes, I did. 
And are you aware of their age difference? They were um, 10 to 11 years different. Okay. Was Lisa younger than he was? Yes. Lisa was uh, 10 to 11 years younger than he was. All right. Um, and we, we went through an email from uh, Miss Andrews already where she was complaining about how sexual he was with her. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, and Deanna, are you familiar with uh, communications between Mr. Alexander and Deanna? Yes, I am. And do you know who Deanna is? Yes. What was I saying? Is, is she uh, a longtime girlfriend of Mr. Alexander? Yes. Yes, she was. Okay. And at this time, in December 7, from, from December to June of 2008, is he still in contact with her? Yes, he is. And did you review communications between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Chriselle? Yes, I did. And... That's a proper weird name, isn't it, Chriselle? Yeah, never heard of that name before. Sounds like Sherbert, doesn't it? It can be. Was, was this woman in a particularly vulnerable position? Yes, she was. And that's based on your review of the things that she said about herself? Yes. And in, the, in their communications, did they have graphic sexual c content? Yes, they did. And Mr. was Mr. Alexander, in reviewing the communications, is it Mr. Alexander who's also is speaking uh, in sexually graphic ways? Yes, he is. Are you familiar with communications between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Reagan? Yes, I am. God bless America. And in these communications is... Is there also, um, is Mr. Alexander being flirtatious? Yes, he is. Is he asking her for pictures? Yes, he does. And close to na naked pictures? Yes, he does. Naked Grandma! And in particular, do you remember reviewing a communication between Mr. Alexander and this woman named Reagan where he complains about having... Here's a the leading nature question. Finish the question, please. Where he complains about having an ex-girlfriend stalking him. Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, jury will disregard the response. Council approach. You may continue. In one of the conversations that you that you reviewed between uh, Mr. Alexander and this woman named Reagan, did he complain that he had a stalker? Yes, he did. Guess who? And incidentally, did he make this complaint timing-wise three days after he had phone sex with Miss Arias? Yes, he did. And about two days after he was sending Miss Arias lovely text messages? Yes. Did you review communications between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Shetanya? Yes, I did. And... Did she just say shit on you? No, it was shit on you. Yeah, shit on you. Shut on, yeah. Bloody hell, I'll tell you something, I'd kick my parents if that were me. Oh, I forgot to ask you, with the woman named Reagan, was she... Did she have any issues such that it put her in a vulnerable position? Yes. And you know that based on the things that she said about herself? Yes. All right. This woman named Shatanya. Um, based on the things that she said about herself, was she put into a vulnerable, was she in a vulnerable position? She was, she was vulnerable. Okay. Um, and she was not uh, LDS, is that right? No, she wasn't. During the conversations between Mr. Alexander and Shaitanya, at some point did, in your review, at some point did he give her the Book of Mormon? Yes, he did. And at some point did he challenge her to read it? Yes, he did. Is that similar to what he did with Miss Arius when he met her? Exactly. And... Talking in their conversations, was there 
talk, uh, graphic, uh, graphically sexual talk in their conversations? Yes. And in fact, in one of their conversations, does Mr. Is there any hearsay in the question? I didn't oh, ask okay. you. May continue. In one of their conversations, does Mr. Alexander, uh, does he talk about having his head between her legs? Yes, he does. So what? He's a red-blooded man. He's, there's no rings on his fingers, as we've said. Yeah, I mean, he was free. Yeah. He could talk about what he wanted to who he wanted, as long as it wasn't hurting anybody. Yeah, I don't think he was. Why are they vilifying him for this? Because it's another way to just drag his character through the mud. Yeah. And he's not wishing it. Is he talking about something that occurred in the past? He's talking about something that occurred. Their conversations in late May. Let's talk, let's talk about those a little bit, okay? All right. Um, is there a point in time when Mr. Alexander, as you read these conversations, was being manipulative with Shaitanya? Yes, he was. And in what way is that, generally speaking, of course? He alluded to um, suicide because she wouldn't come over okay. to visit. And does this conversation go on? The, does this conversation go on for a little while? All of these claims she is making, like you know, um, alluding suicide, I'm just taking with a pinch of salt until Wang gets up because I'm sure he's going to blow all the, the all of these out of the water. Yeah, I'm sure he is. He's going to unravel every single bit of it. Yeah, a lot of this that she's been saying and her reviewing and and relating of. You know, the text messages, the journals, what she knows. There's quite a bit of it that just does not add up. There's a lot of it that doesn't add up. Um, and it isn't because she is a defense witness. It just just doesn't ring true no, at it, all. No, it doesn't. I mean, if any of this was true, there'd be evidence. Yeah, and I'm sure it'll come out pretty soon when Mr. Martinez gets up from his seat. Yeah, and I can't wait for that. Where he's I'm, talking about suicide. He's, he talks about suicide maybe three times or so. All right. And ultimately, does this woman say no to him? She doesn't have the time to come over. She does. And after all of that, does, what, what is his response? He... Rephrase the question. Sustained. Not, not his exact response, but what does he do? What does he do? He um, IMs her. I think these are IMs. I don't know if they're IMs or texts. Okay. But whatever, he, he continues with that, and she stops communicating with him. Okay. And is he still trying to contact her without him, her contacting him back? Yes. And that during this time period for Mr. Alexander, he had, in March, um, lost Lisa Andrews. Is that right? Yes. And in up. April, he had lost Miss Arias. Yes. Not completely, but he had. <laughs> he lost her, phys her, her, Physical her physically, presence. right? Yes. And in, in reviewing his journal article, his journal entries, was he still um, pining for, for Miss Andrews? Pining for the fields? I believe he was, yes. He was missing Miss Andrews. Missing Miss Andrews, okay. Yes. Did you review uh, messages uh, or communications between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Maria? Yes, I did. And uh, Maria was LDS, is that right? Yes, she was. But despite that, did he have sexual talk with her? Yes, he did. And did he talk about sneaking her out of his grandma's house? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. And is that something that he did with Miss Arias? Yes. Conversations do you see with in Maria, his... do you see him pushing sexual boundaries with her? Yes, he does. Uh, do you see him, in these conversations, do you see him trying to go as far as he can? He, he's asking her how far 
they could go before they'd have to go see the bishop. Okay, and then, and how does he do that? Does he give her examples? He does give her examples. He gives her examples of what he called. Does he give her examples? Yes. Okay, and does he get to a point where it's too graphic for her? Yes, he gets, well, he gets to a point where um, she doesn't want to talk anymore about it. Okay. So he overstepped his bounds, so he went a little too far. Doesn't make him an abuser, doesn't make him violent, doesn't make him, you know, the toxic narcissist that she is. No, she's just re re reverting everything she's done onto him. Yeah, as we said, projection. In reviewing these communications, um, in reviewing these communications between Mr. Alexander and these, and these women, uh, what, what is it that you learn from it? As far as, as, as far as your assessment with this relationship and Mr. Alexander? One of the things I see is a pattern in the way he connects with women um, and in general goes after women that are younger than him or in a vulnerable place. Um, he also pushes sexual boundaries. He sort of uh, throws comments out to see how far he can go. Um, there's just a pattern in the way he treats women in a very sexual way, a very sexualized way. Um, although he has other conversations with them as well, he sexualizes them. Um, he, he doesn't tend to have long relationships. Um, most of these relationships um, are over the internet or, or you know, texting or uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there are a few that are also in person, several that he's met with in person. But they're not long-term, they're not connected, they're, they don't seem to be close relationships. And in several of the relationships, he is um, trying to encourage the women to join PPL, uh, his business, uh, or to give him a couple of leads. Okay. As to that, he probably just hadn't met the right girl yet. And he was trying to meet the right girl. He thought he'd met her with Jody. Obviously not. He had his sights set on Lisa Andrews before he was murdered. Yeah, and that's who he w wanted to marry. I think that's who he wanted to be with. In spite of the age gap, um, I think there was a genuine, you know, affection, genuine love there for her. Um, and it's such a shame that he didn't live to kind of see it out although i do understand lisa is happily married now with children so you know maybe you know she went on to the best for her maybe it wouldn't have worked out with travis well they don't well we'll never know now will we? we won't know unfortunately but um it's just interesting to speculate how different the future would have probably would have been for both of them had travis lived yeah uh does he in these conversations does he put himself out there uh, as a virgin yes he does he consistently puts himself out as a virgin. Given the timing of when all of this is happening in, in late spring of 2008, do you see any type of, do you see any, any indications of desperation from Mr. Alexander? His, his um, he seems to be particularly with, with women who pull away. Um, he seems to be more desperate in his relationship with Jody Arias uh, because there's an escalation in his, um, his verbal abuse and his physical abuse. He, when Shaitanya pulls away, he, uh, re he emails her to try to get in touch with him. Um, the other women that he's in contact with continue to be in contact with him, so I don't see it there. Okay, so is it the... So you see the desperation when the woman is, is pulling away from him? Yes. Wilmot's language is really rankling me. Desperation. I mean, she's, she's not just trampling on his grave. She's not just walking on it. She's pissing all over it. Uh, and do you, see, do you see that with regard to Lisa Andrews? I saw that in regard to Lisa Andrews, that when they would break up, he was... Um, continually, you know, trying to make up with her, and they would make up. Um, but when they eventually talked about engagement, um, the relationship ended. Miss um, Andrews said it was mutual because his financial uh, situation wouldn't allow him to support her. 
but that was when that relationship began to pull apart. Okay. For the last time. For the last time. All right. Well, there are players and there are stayers, and you're not even a player, Alice. Yes, we're doing some breaks, and we'll take our recess at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 10 minutes after 3. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. You may step down, Ms. LaViola. Counsel, I'd like to see you at the bench, please. One glass of milk, one cookie, and a nap later. We'll show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. You may continue. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Ms. LaViolette, I forgot to ask you one thing about the woman named Chriselle. Was she married? Yes, she was. Is that part of what put her in a vulnerable position? Yes, it is. All right, I want to talk to you about, um, we know that the last, uh, we hear from Miss Arias through her journals on June 1st is that uh, Mr. Alexander was guilting her about not seeing him. Is that right? right? Yes. At some point on June 3rd, are you aware of uh, them having at least one conversation where he is guilting her again? Yes. And during that conversation, was Miss Arias able to say no? No. I'm just a girl who can't say no. So... At some point then, does she then go to Mesa to visit uh, Mr. Alexander? Yes, she does. As far as your understanding goes, what happens when she arrives? She arrives very early in the morning. Um, they go to bed and sleep for a little while. Um, they get up, and um, there's rope. Um, Apparently, they have done this one time before where um, he ties her to the bed. What a load of old crap! Um, and it is with twine, and so that was uncomfortable, so they bought rope, or he bought rope. Um, he ties her hands to the bed. They have sex. Then uh, there are pictures taken uh, of her genitals. I think I'm going to puke. After the pictures are taken, um, they uh, I believe that, that uh, she goes to shower. And when she, after she showers, um, they're going to look at CDs of the trips that they've taken. And the first CD that she pulls out, or the CD is, is scratched or won't play, and that Mr. Alexander gets very upset and throws it. Um, and then they have, he, he bends her over the uh, desk, and they have sex again. <laughs> uh, it's rougher this time, but she says it's still consensual. Um, is that something that she would rather do than face anger from him? It's something she has consistently done to quell his anger. Okay. It's a full of shit. Um, after, after that... Um, he goes into the shower and wants her to take some pictures of him because he's been working out and he's kind of proud of the way his body is looking. And um, she drops the camera. And uh, he gets very upset because she drops the camera. And um As we've said before in other episodes, um, she crashes his BMW and he's like, yeah, whatever. But she drops his camera onto a rug where it's likely not to be damaged that badly. Yeah. And he goes all homicidal on her. That that doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. No, it doesn't compute that. I mean, why would he get angry over a camera and not his car? Yeah, I mean, a car's a hell of a lot more expensive and a lot more practical. You'll you'll need a camera more every a, a car more every day than a camera. Exactly. And I refuse to believe that she drops this camera and he decides to you know, try to kill her over it. I'm sorry. That's just that's just a load of rubbish. It's just unbelievable. Uh, she seriously, be, you know, thinks that we should believe that that everybody <laughs> should that she thinks that's a plausible story. It's a crap story. It's pathetic. Says that uh, a kindergartner can take better pictures, or five year old could do this better, and and apparently comes out of the shower 
body slams her. She falls to the ground. Um, she wriggles away and um, runs into the closet, gets the gun that he has in the closet, and he comes after her again and is coming at her like a football player, and she does not believe the gun's loaded, but she f points it at him and shoots. And after that, she really doesn't remember anything right. until she gets to Hoover Dam. And just to put this in perspective, you, your evaluation of this case has to do with the, their relationship really leading up to this point. Is that right? Yes, it really does. Okay. And so any specific facts as far as what a, the, the specificity of what happens on that day, is that important to you, more important to you than, than the context of their relationship altogether? No, I, I was retained on this case to look at whether or not I believe there was domestic violence that had occurred in their relationship. And that's really specifically what I was supposed to do, and that's what I did. Okay. Well, that's what I did. Do you have a... In your time that you've worked with battered women, uh, do you have any experience in, in how they cope with trauma? Yes, I do. What is that? Well, there are different ways that they cope with trauma, but one of the things that, that happens is that they can repress things. They can uh, block memories. They can block, block painful, painful things in their relationships. Um, they minimize. They deny. Sometimes they uh, find things to distract themselves. Uh, it really depends on every relationship or, or every person who's battered, every survivor is different. And so they, they use different things, but a number of women will block out painful memories, Another, a number of women minimize and deny in their relationship. There's uh, a pattern for most battered women that they empathize with the person who hurts them. Um, and that the bottom lines are dropping a little at a time, and as the bottom lines are dropping and as the self-esteem is dropping, then you uh, also begin to see that the, the um, apprehension is usually going up at that point. The apprehension for the woman? Yes, the apprehension for the survivor in regard to the, the perpetrator. Okay. Uh, do you notice, have you ever noticed in your counseling with battered women, do they ever detach from... The, the trauma that they're experiencing? Yes, they often detach because the memories are very painful. Um, so they will, um, they can look removed. And in fact, um, what, I've, what I've seen, uh, because sometimes we'll have battered women come out and tell their stories um, when we do public speaking or in training or that sort of thing. And when they have to tell their stories very much, initially, um, when they begin to tell their stories, there's generally a lot of emotion, or when they begin to feel that. But as they talk about the story and they tell it, they begin to detach from all of that feeling that was generated at the beginning. Um, I think in, in part because it's too painful, and in part because they, they want to heal, and in part because the more you tell something, the more rote it gets, in, a, in effect. Okay, throughout that, I... I was kind of thinking, um, this was five, five, six years before the Me Too era started, essentially, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, during the Me Too era, as we all know, um, several women came forward and spoke of abuse. Uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence, yeah. sexual abuse, sexual violence even. Sexual harassment. Yeah. Um, loads of women came out. There were some, you know, most of them had genuine cases. There were some that were just doing it for the publicity. It always strikes me that a big case, you know, that, that Jody didn't shout loud enough from a prison cell and say, hey, this is me too, I need to be listened to. Maybe she did. I think that the last hearings took place like two or three years ago, didn't they, on this? I think so, yeah. I'm not quite sure, though. So maybe she did. I mean, if she did shout up, I didn't hear it, I'm, and you didn't either, did you? No. But um, knowing her, she's devious enough to kind of take advantage of this and turn it 
in her favour and twist it. We all know Amber Heard tried to do it. Yeah, but at least Amber Heard at least took photographs. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, you think about it, right? No photographs, no witnesses, no eyewitnesses of any bruises, any injuries no at all. No police reports, no Jody. hospital reports, nothing. No, yeah, um, nobody coming forward to say she told me that Travis was hitting me, hitting her, you know. No one coming forward saying he's very, very aggressive and abusive. Yeah. There, uh, there is a significant lack of evidence of domestic abuse, domestic violence in this case when it comes to domestic violence against her. That's right. probably why she didn't go for the Me Too movement because she knew it wasn't true. Could, yeah, and that there was a lack of, of evidence. But regardless of this... La well, no, taking this lack of evidence into consideration, why the hell did Alice take this case? Because, you know, prior to this, I'm sure she was very respected. In a way, it's very sad to see her kind of be the architect of her own downfall, isn't it? Yeah, but then again, when there's money involved... Yeah, but... Your principles go out the window. Yeah, but her principles, after having seen so many, you know, genuine cases, she could have said no to this. Maybe it was the money. Maybe it was the, 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 the you know, elevated profile. I don't know. All I know is this, there's no, there's no real way she should have taken this case based on the lack of evidence. No, but then again, neither should have Samuels. No. Um, and unfortunately, both the reputation suffered as a result, didn't they? Yeah. All right. Have you seen any of that with Jody? Yes, I have. And how? Well, you know, with Jody, I think that at the end of that relationship and toward the end of the relationship, she was really in touch with her shame. 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 She was getting in touch with how bad she felt about herself about the shame about what she was doing and she was becoming very aware of that and she talks about that there, there's conversation about that with mr alexander and what happened was that she wrote things that she never thought anybody would see she took pictures she never thought anybody would see and that her shame is now public and I'm not sure what any human being would do if their most private thoughts and their genitalia were made public consumption. And that's what's happened with this, with social media and everything. And I th I, I'm not sure how you hold up under that. I'm not sure what you do to hold up under that and how you um, do that without becoming somewhat detached to be able to do it. What you've learned, uh, what Jody has told you about what happened on June 4th, uh, and she talks about Mr. Alexander attacking her from the shower and being full of rage. Does that correlate at all with anything that you've seen in the escalation leading up to June 4th? Objection. Previous court order, speculation. Approach. Ms. LaViolette, when we were talking about escalation and, and the things that you see through reading his own words uh, in April and May and the physical abuse, all that escalation and the fear that you talked about that abusive men have about their partner leaving, does that, is there any correlation between that and the ability for Mr. Alexander to be rageful? Yes, there is a correlation between those two things. There's definitely a correlation. Can you explain the correlation? The correlation is that, that fear is an emotion that is um, fear and powerlessness about the situation, um, escalate anger. And um, when I've spoken to many of the men in my program, one of the things we do, we do some exercises on powerlessness because um, that's where a lot of it comes from and that's what they talk about. They talk about the powerlessness that they feel. And um, so we talk about power in a non-hierarchical way. We talk about power, the power of um, 
making decisions as a group, the power of moving your agenda along without hurting anybody else, you know, the power of, of feeling good, the power of an apology is one of the things that, that people will do, the, the kind of apology that's a gift, where you don't want anything from somebody else, where you're, you're really, you know, how strong you can feel with that. And so uh, the men talk about a lot of those things, about how they feel about different kinds of power. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're pretty incredible conversations, actually. And when they lose that power, is that something that turns, that results in fear and ultimately anger and rage? Yes. While I don't doubt any of that has real basis, you know, in the real world, I don't doubt that. It has none in this case. It's all completely irrelevant and bollocks, isn't it? All crap. Yeah. What about the, the idea that it takes two to tango? In other words, that it takes two to make an argument. Do you see that in, in these abusive relationships? Well, if you're in a pretty healthy relationship, it takes two to tango. But if you're in an abusive relationship, you can tango with one person. And, uh, you know, that often comes up as a subject, uh, that it takes two to tango. But as I read the instant messages, what you hear is it really doesn't particularly matter what Miss Arias does. Mr. Alexander is still able to continue. And I see that a lot when somebody's on a roll and they're really upset. It sort of doesn't matter what the other person does. They can be quiet and that can escalate. They can say something smart alecky and it can escalate. They can say something calming and it can escalate. So when you're in an abusive relationship, the two to tango rule sort of falls to the wayside. And what's the betting that Travis had to watch his words around Jodie? No, I wouldn't take that bet at all. I agree. All right. Given everything that you have reviewed, that you've read in this case, that you've seen, do you have an opinion, an ultimate opinion in your expertise about whether or not uh, Miss Arias was in, in an, abuse, an abusive relationship? Yes, I believe she was in a re, uh, an abusive relationship. And do you believe, in your expert opinion, that Jody was a battered woman, or is a battered woman? Yes, I do. Don't be bloody, bloody stupid! And is there a difference between isolated acts of aggression versus a pattern of aggression? Yes, uh, isolated acts of aggression where actually anybody's capable of an isolated act of aggression. And um, many people have you know, found themselves, uh, you know, ha having an isolated act of aggression. The pattern is, is what makes it different. Okay. The pattern of, of, and the context that it occurs in. So it's not just about physical abuse, it's about the emotional abuse. It's about the way somebody begins to feel about themselves. It's about the development of chronic apprehension. All right, and so when you're talking about patterns and ultimately saying that Jody is a battered woman, do you look at these patterns to make that determination? Yes, I do. And is that what you've seen here? That's what I've seen in this relationship. She's seen everything but because she's seen it from one point of view. Yeah, that's true. I want to ask you why. What do you base this on? And I'm going to put up uh, Exhibit 558, which is, your, which is the continuum that we talked about when you first took the stand. I want to ask you why. Why do you say that Jody's a battered woman? Well, nobody fits in a, in a linear column. Okay. Human beings don't. So there are different kinds of things that happen in this relationship. Uh, certainly putting down friends and family. Um, there's some destruction of property, but uh, it seems minimal at this point. Um, a change in the victim's personality. Uh, Jody is described by her two prior intimate relationships as um, generally happy. Happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy. Uh, sweet, creative, lots of, lots of different things um, that are positive. They also say she can be a, a pain in the butt. Uh, which I'm sure that any of us can be a pain in the butt in a relationship. Uh, but what you begin to see is her moving into more depression, moving into more self-blame. Uh, 
they had talked about her as being uh, good with other people. You see her pulling away from other relationships over time. Um, so there's a, a lot of change in, in who she is. Um, you, you see, see oh, I'm sorry. Um, you see threats of definitely threats of abandonment. Uh, Where are you looking? What, I see you're looking up at the. I'm looking. looking up the, I'm looking at abuse and battery. Okay, between abuse and a battery. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm looking at character assassination because character assassination, um, and I don't even think I have it up there, do I? But I see that under abuse you have name calling, but not character assassination, right? Yeah. What a comprehensive attention to detail person you are, Alice Love. <laughs> yeah. And then character assassination, you've told us earlier, is worse. Yes. And so worse I would put ca character assassination in more high-end uh, battering relationship. Okay, a high-end battering relationship? Yes, and you've got also, you've got, uh, for a period of time with Ms. Arias, you've got the monopolization of perception, where she tends to see the world through his eyes as opposed to her own. Um, and you see manipulation. I mean, I don't have everything up there. Right. And that's just a, a guideline. It's just a framework. If you look at, um, you know, Dan Sinkin's work, he goes into a lot more detail than I do. Okay. Um, then why the cocky Nora didn't they get him instead of bloody Alice? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they couldn't. Um, well, and that's what we talked about earlier, right? That uh, that no one human is going to exactly fit into one category, right? Right. Okay. Um, but it, this does does this give us an idea of uh, what a battering relationship might look like, or a terrorist relationship might look like? Yeah, I I don't think that. Uh, I mean, there are definitely things that that are higher end battering. I don't think terrorism. Hey, you, you believe in kafar bastards? Tends to include a lot more uh, violation of other laws, that kind of thing. So it tends to be the smallest percentage of people who are abusive. Right. Okay. Um, what about uh, you? See, do you see psychological and emotional abuse? Yes, I do. And do you see? And part of that is the greater or the more severe character assassination. Right. What about physical abuse? Well, there's an escalation in physical abuse. So. You wouldn't be seeing, for instance, when you're looking at lower level abuse, you don't see choking. You don't see more frequent um, incidents. You usually, when you're looking at lower level abuse, and I say that not out of disrespect to people in that in that category, uh, in the in the victims in that category, because they can have very low level abuse and still have very high levels of fear. So it's not about the level of fear. It's more about the behavior that's part of that. And the behavior that's part of that tends to be um, lower level kinds of physical abuse, which would be pushing and hitting, and, and lower level injury, um, which might be a bruise or a contusion, something like that. Um, but choking is considered high end. Um, so is breaking a finger. Kicking is considered high end. So what you're seeing is um, physical abuse at a, at a higher level. You're seeing definitely uh, the character assassination at a higher level. You see manipulation. You see deception. You see chronic infidelity. I mean, there's a lot going on here. You see my spotty ass love. That's what you say. All right. And, and... The other thing is, of course, the um, family of origin issues. Okay, and we see that at the top of your continuum with the exacerbating factors, right? Yes. Okay, and and that the family of origin you're talking about is specific to Mr. Alexander's family. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, is this something that Jody could have seen from the beginning? No, I. You know. You don't start out in an abusive relationship with an abusive relationship. And I think that's really important to understand that the way this started was with Miss Arias meeting a very charming young man who was handsome, who uh, wooed her, who uh, got her address to be able to go uh, from a friend to, to be able to go to an executive director's you know, brunch who, or dinner, who was, um, 
who was someone who made her feel very special. That's what people attach to at the beginning. They don't attach to, in general, they don't attach to somebody who's violent and doesn't treat them well. They attach to the best part of this human being. But what happens over time is that if you tend to be abusive, you're unable to maintain that. You, um, that beginning stage where you have all that big energy from being in love with someone, that tends to go down. And if you're a child who grows up in an abusive household, and the more abusive, the, you know, there's a positive correlation there generally with how people uh, re react as adults, that child who is grown now becomes scared in an intimate relationship. I mean, intimate relationships are scary for people. Uh, healthy people are scared in intimate relationships. So when you're dealing with somebody who's abusive, the emotional fear can be really debilitating for them. And that's what begins to take over. The fear, you know, it's called sometimes chronic combat readiness, that these kids have been around violence enough that they're, they're in a state of, a perpetual state of apprehension. And what happens is they develop I, what I would call an emotional reflex. So they're reactive. They're coming from a reactive place instead of a responsive place. And so over time, that's what you start to see. You start to see the person become abusive, um, even when they don't want to be. Okay, I've let that just play out and just let it go on and on and on there because if I was on that jury now, actually not now, well before this, I would have stopped even looking at her while she was talking. Every time she opens her mouth to speak, I would have looked away and looked elsewhere. And you know what? That would have made Nermi, De La Rosa and the defence team very nervous if even one juror was doing that. Well, yeah, because it would not be a good sign. It'd be a sign that they don't believe it. Yes, and that they do not hold this woman with any credibility whatsoever, despite her, you know, um, Pr proposed expertise. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be looking at it. I wouldn't even be looking her way. I would be looking away when she is testifying, when she's talking, because that is how much she has lost me. Yeah, but it also could look uh, onto certain people that they're not really interested in p or paying attention. Yeah, it could. It could be. But th they have no evidence to suggest that that, that juror is not listening. Yeah, but they have to be p professional. Yeah, they do have to be professional, but you can also, you know, um, reflect how you are feeling through your actions and you can s not look at someone and still listen to them. I wonder so, if the jurors, though, will have any questions. Oh, I'm sure they will. I'm sure by the time one gets finished and um, they will have questions and then Wilmot will come up and rebut them and one will... T there'll, there'll be questions galore after this, I think. But <laughs> um, I do imagine that the jury is going to pull her apart as every bit as much as one does. Yeah. Because if I was on that jury, and I'm sure if you were on that jury, we would, wouldn't we? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh what about um, the information that you've used to make this assessment about Jody and about the relationship between Jody and Mr. Alexander? That information, is this all coming from either Jody's mouth or from her journals? No, not at all. I, I reviewed, um, well, I've got a box at home that's this big, and I've reviewed. Um, I reviewed tapes from uh, CBS 48 Hours Mystery. I reviewed um, IMs and text messages, and I don't know what the other things are. Emails. G emails. I reviewed um, small portions of Mr. Alexander's journal. I've reviewed some things that he's written, some of his writing about his family. But never spoke to any of them. Um, I've reviewed the comments from uh, between him and other women and the events between and the, and the IMs between uh, Mr. Alexander and uh, Jody Arias. And I don't believe 
anyone provokes somebody to an ongoing pattern of violence. What do you mean by that? We are the experts in relationship, I think, of pushing each other's buttons. When you're in a relationship with somebody, you pretty much know how to get to them. But And what a wonderfully accurate description of her own client, eh? So there's, there's provocation that happens in healthy and normal relationships. People provoke each other. The difference is that in an abusive relationship, nobody can provoke that pattern. That a pattern tends to go from relationship to relationship um, if the relationship is long enough and intimate enough. And that's what I've seen over time with the men in my group. If they're connected to the woman, and a lot of times that is sexual connection, uh, intimate connection, there's more likelihood that they're going to act out. You talked about long enough and intimate enough. So in speaking with um, specifically about Mr. Alexander, when he was dating Lisa Andrews, that went on for months. Uh, does it make a difference uh, with abusive relationships if he was never intimate with her versus being intimate with Jody? That makes a difference. The other thing that makes a difference is they were really only together for eight months. Um, when Miss Arias uh, lived out of state, there was not a lot going on, and she lived out of state for about eight months. So there was not as much intimate connection between her and Mr. Alexander until she moved back um, because they lived in separate places. But with Lisa Andrews, um, what you saw was that they broke up three times in that eight-month period. There was some physical contact, for sure, but um, there wasn't sex. To your recollection, sweetheart, Yeah. did Lisa Andrews say that Travis raised, it, raised even a finger to her? No, she didn't. Not at all. And they broke up three times. Now you think about it, if you break up with someone three times and you're a violent person, right, violence is bound to be involved. Well, yeah. I mean, well, bre breaking up is never pleasant, is it? Well, no, it's, there's always a reason behind it. Even if it's, if it's amicable, it's never, it, it, there's, there's always loss, isn't there? And there's always some sort of rage period, anger period that you go through. Oh, absolutely. If Lisa and Travis broke up three times and Travis was truly as violent as these two are trying to, well, these three, the whole team are trying to paint him out to be, then I am sure that there would have been violence involved. It, it's common sense. It stands to reason. If I am wrong, anybody out there, if you disagree, please let me know. Yeah, please. But if you are a habitually violent person and you... You know, you were violent to your spouse or your girlfriend or whatever. And you break up three times. There has to have been violence involved. But Lisa did not report a single incident. So just bear that in mind. Yeah. Sexual intimacy. But it's, it was a length of time that was not particularly significant either. All right. So, would, so then would it surprise you if, if she didn't complain about Mr. Alexander being physically abusive with her? Yeah, it would surprise me that... It well, would, maybe I asked a double negative. Okay. Is it, would it be, I don't know. <laughs> How would you feel if Miss, if Miss Andrews did not complain about physical abuse from Mr. Alexander? That she did not complain didn't about it? it? Right. I wouldn't find that unusual. And she did complain about other things and about her, the pressure and about the, um, on her sexually. She did complain about, um, him pushing on her boundaries. She did complain about him putting her down. She did complain about those things. Okay. You talked a little bit about the difference, um, about the change, um, change in personality from, of, of Jody. How do you know that she has a change? What is it that, what information is it that you have in order to make that assessment? I, I um, read the interviews with her two previous boyfriends. Uh, one was, uh, Matt McCartney, who she had about a two-year relationship, and the other one was um, Daryl Brewer, who she had a four-year relationship. And Daryl Brewer actually says he saw her change sort of before his eyes from a very responsible person, um, you know, a very, you know, a more outgoing, happy person, and she changed, and she 
you know, so he had descriptions of her and talked about that. Um, so I read what the way she was described by her other partners, um, and they had significant time with her, so I thought there was some accuracy with that. The other thing is that she still maintained friendships with both of them, and that usually says something positive. Uh, when relationships break up, oftentimes people, certainly for a period of time, uh, aren't friendly with each other, or they or they don't have a friendship after that, but she maintained friendships with both of them, which is a positive thing. So this is Matt and Daryl, isn't it? Yeah, that's who she, I think that's who she's talking about. Yeah, no sign of Bobby. <laughs> He's probably in a castle in Transylvania. Yeah, or sleeping in his coffin. All right. And based on your review of the case, did you learn about the, the changes that occurred with, with Jody then after being with Mr. Alexander? Yes, she was. She became, um, well, they described her as uh, bipolar, meaning that she went back and forth in her moods. Um, so she not was, an actual diagnosis? No, her. not a diagnosis. Okay. People say bipolar. Okay. Um, uh, there's, uh, usually when people say bipolar, what they mean is uh, she goes from one mood to another, and it looks like it's happening relatively quickly. And, and she was described as moody uh, prior to that. But this was a more extreme change, and this was described more by Mr. Brewer. Okay. And what about... Um, um, her depression and suicidal t- tendencies, those types of things. Is that something that changed for her after being with Mr. Alexander? Yes. Um, neither, neither Mr. McCartney nor Mr. Brewer described uh, Jody Arias as suicidal. I am not... Suicide. And, or, and what about any type of deep depression with her? They describe her as generally happy. And they, they talk about her crying and that she can, she can fluctuate in mood, but they don't talk about her having deep depression that they, I read. Okay. And did they talk about, when, when you say crying, is that what happens when she gets upset that she would cry? Yes. Not an unusual response. All right. Did either one of them ever describe her as a liar? No. I have a couple of additional questions for you. Uh, I know we, it was a couple days ago when we established that you sent books to Jody, right? Yes, I did. And is that about five books that you sent to her? I think I sent her four books and a magazine subscription. Okay. Oh, what a lucky psycho she is to have two virtual libraries at her disposal. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I guess I'll get this out of the way now. Do you have a memory problem? No, I don't. The more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. And do you have any feelings for Jody such that it would impair your abilities to make an honest assessment about her as a battered woman or about her relationship with Mr. Alexander? No, I don't. Well, all I can say is, Alice, get your knife and fork, your serviette, as you call it here, your napkin, as they call it, over the pond. Um, And a lovely plate because you're about to eat every single word that you uttered on that stand, love. Yeah, and I can't wait to see that. In everything, the text messages, everything that you've reviewed in this case and from Mr. Alexander's own words, did you ever hear about any patterns where Jody was being physically abusive or aggressive with Mr. Alexander? No, I did not. Did you ever see any patterns of verbal abuse from Jody to Mr. Alexander? No, I did not. Did you ever see any patterns of psychological abuse um, or controlling behavior by Jody to Mr. Alexander? No, I did not. Then why was she the first person that everybody mentioned when the police asked if anyone had a problem or a personal grudge against Travis. Why was she the only person anybody said? Because she was the only one. There was no one, there was no one else. Exactly. And did you ever see any evidence, evidence at all, of jealousy from Jody 
to Mr. Alexander. No, I didn't. I have nothing for the judge. Thank you. Okay, firstly, thank Christ that's over. Before we get on to Juan's questioning, let's just kind of sum up what we've heard. So, a great amount of hearsay. Yeah, it's all hearsay. No Uh, evidence at all to back it up. Absolute hearsay, yeah. Um, And a lot of assumptions about Travis made on his behalf by Alice through one person's eyes, Jodie's. Um, No you know, background, you know, interviews or anything with his family, with his friends. Um, She's seen a few documentaries, a few 48 hours things. She's read some of Travis's writings. That does not give you an informed picture. No, it doesn't because it's also out of context. Yeah. Once again, we've said this many times before, but we have to keep repeating it. What they have is a giant turd and they are trying to polish it with the nicest polish they possibly can, but they cannot do it. No, it won't come clean. Right, well, are you are you ready to witness some true carnage? Come on, Juan. All right, let's do it. Cross-examination. Yeah. Give me that. Yeah, one of the things that... Uh, you told us earlier was that uh, you have a bachelor's degree, correct? No, I have a master's degree. Well, before that, you had to have a bachelor's degree, correct? Yes, I did. What year did you get your bachelor's degree? 1969. And then after that, you did get the master's degree, right? Yes, I did. And what year was that? 1980. So there was a span of time between the bachelor's and the master's degree, correct? Yes, there was. And ma'am, one of the things that you didn't tell us was that after the master's degree, you did not continue in your studies, did you? I'm not sure what you mean. You did not obtain a PhD, did you? No, but I continued in studies. So did, so is it true that you did obtain a PhD then? No, I continued in my studies. I took classes and I, took, I take CEUs every year. Plus she watches a lot of documentaries. <laughs> yeah, she must do to believe all the crap she's just told. So the answer is no, you do not have a PhD, correct? No, I don't have a PhD. And since you don't have a PhD, ma'am, there are certain restrictions that you that are placed on you that are not placed on an individual with a PhD, correct? Yes. For example, you cannot administer any tests, correct? I don't administer tests. The answer is no, then, correct? Yes. And the other thing that you can't do is you can't read any psychological test either, correct? I can't read any psychological test? In other tests? words... You may have some training in what you do, but in terms of looking at a psychological test, you may have some idea, but you have to rely on others that have more schooling and training than you to be able to tell you what the results are of a particular test, right? I would tell you that we have different training. And in terms of psychological tests, I would not be doing psychological tests. In terms of other things, I might have more training than someone with a PhD. I'm not asking about other areas. I'm talking about psychological tests. Do we understand each other? We definitely understand each other. I predict that is going to be one's next catchphrase, because with Jody, it was, are you having memory problems? Yeah, this is going to be... A... Do we understand each other, or are we understanding each other? I it, predict that's going to be his catchphrase. It probably will be. With regard to the psychological testing, it's true that you do not have the expertise to be able to engage, if you will, in the reading of tests, correct? Correct. And you can't score tests, correct? Correct. And in fact, you're aware of what is known as the dsm 4 right? Yes, I am. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that uh, psychologists and sometimes psychiatrists use in diagnosing uh, individuals, correct? Actually, that's not correct. There is no such book as a dsm 4 Psychotherapists also use that book, and I am a psychotherapist, Mr. Martinez. So you do use that book then, right? I've used that book. And with regard to this particular case, isn't it true that in that book that you say that you use and that you are familiar with, isn't it true that in that book there is no diagnosis of battered woman, right? True. There is no indication or any diagnosis of an abused woman either, correct? Yes. First little bits of the foundations chipped away. Yeah, and I'm sure there's more to come. You may continue. Overruled. 
With regard to the DSM-IV, is it true that it does not have a diagnosis of quote-unquote battered woman, right? True. And now, what we really have in this particular field is what you do, correct? You have somebody who has experience, right? Well, I, I want to hear what you're talking about. Wait, can do you, you or do you not have experience in dealing with what you allege to be battered women? I do. And with regard to that experience and making a determination whether or not an individual is a battered woman, basically what you have available to you are clinical interviews, right? That's one thing that we have available. Right. And basically a clinical interview is you sitting across from the person that may or may not be uh, a victim of battering and talking to them, right? That's one of the things I use. Right? That's what you do, right? That's, that's one, one of the your, things I do. That's one of your main instruments, if you will, in trying to determine whether or not the situation It involved. is not my main instrument, Mr. Martinez. <clears throat> is it one of the items that you use? It is one of the things that I use, correct. And in this particular case, you told us that what? You spent, what, 40 hours talking to the defendant? 44. 44 hours? So that's the clinical interview aspect of it, correct? I used that as one of the, that is the clinical interview that I did, right? Yes or no? You, that is the clinical aspect of your practice, correct? It is a clinical aspect of my practice. Correct. And in this case, the 44 hours, that's the clinical aspect of this evaluation, right? Somehow I get the feeling that your rear end is puckering up. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by the clinical aspect. Well, a clinical interview, as you know what a clinical interview is, right? Of course I know what a clinical interview is. All right, is. then we seem to be having problems with it. With regard to a clinical interview, ma'am, isn't that a situation where you sit across from an individual and you talk to them about the issue that is at hand? Isn't that true? You interview them. You ask questions. You do an assessment. So when you are interviewing, you're not talking then, right? Mr. Martinez, yes I think... Yes or no? My question is, are you talking yes or no? Mr. Martinez, are you angry at me? my god that's gold <laughs> we knew we were expecting a load of laughs in this one mr martinez are you angry at me oh that's brilliant oh thank you for the laugh alice thank you so much <laughs> she's trying to get one back on him ma'am is that relevant to you is that important to you please refrain from laughing in the courtroom <laughs> Is that important to you whether or not the prosecutor is angry to you with regard to your evaluation? Does that make any difference to your evaluation whether or not the prosecutor is angry? Yes or no? Judge, judge, comment question. It makes a difference to me the way I'm spoken to and I would like you to speak to me the way I speak to you. Ma'am, is it true that just because the prosecutor is angry at you, is that going to make you change your uh, answer with regard to whether or not this is a battering situation? No, certainly then, not. The fact that the prosecutor may or may not, or you may perceive him as being angry, that really has nothing to do with your evaluation, does it? No, but it certainly is. Yes or no? Does it have anything to do with your evaluation? And judge, say yes or no answer. Judge, judge, she's trying to answer the question. Some of these questions cannot be answered by yes or no. Ms. Lavalli, can you answer that question, yes or no? I'm not sure at this point what the question is because when someone is approaching in that way, it's very hard to listen. All right. Restate your question. Just because somebody has a demeanor that you perceive to be angry, is that going to sway your opinion as to what you think in this case? No, it isn't. Is it going to change anything about your evaluation based on the way the questions are asked? No. So in this case, when we're talking about the interview, the clinical interview, what we're talking about you doing is speaking to the defendant across the table about the issues in this case, right? Yes. And that's the interview, speaking with each other, you spent 44 hours, right? Yes. This is Jody part two testimony because it took him an insane amount of questions to get a straight answer out of her. It looks like we're in for the same thing now. Yeah, but then again, I think she's a bit embarrassed because she's been found out. Yeah, and 
early indications as well is she's been every bit as, as evasive as Jody was in answering as well. Oh, yeah. Definitely. The other thing that uh, you indicated to us was that, well, you looked at a lot of other collateral items, right? Yes. You looked at journals, that's what you indicated, right? One of the things I looked at. Sure, and you, you indicated that you looked at writings of interviews with other people, right? That I looked interviews at. Interviews that were done by somebody else. Yes, yes. You looked at text messages, right? Yes. Instant messages, right? Yes. Emails, right? Yes. And that's how your evaluation was in this particular case, right? That is correct. You did not, other than talking to the defendant, you did not talk to anybody yourself, right? That is correct. So you were left, if you will, in terms of the materials that you were to review, not from the defendant, not about the journals, you were sort of left to just read what somebody else had written about an interview with a collateral source, right? On those particular collateral yes. sources, on the yes. interview parts, certainly, not on the IMs and the texts. I'm talking about the collateral sources that actually somebody wrote down a synopsis, right? right? Yes. And one of the things that we know with regard to your particular approach is that since there are no, there is no diagnosis in the DSM-4, there really is no, if you will, guide out there to tell you when somebody is really a battered individual or if somebody is an abused individual, right? That's not correct. Well, what we actually have there is, let's take an exhibit number 558. Isn't this what you used to tell us? That was an example. Yeah, I'm not done my, oh, I'm sorry. I isn't this true, Exhibit 558? Isn't that what you ended your testimony with, uh, talking about this particular continuum of aggression and abuse to tell us that the defendant, in your opinion, was the victim of abuse, right? That was not the only thing that I used, yes, Mr. Martinez. Yes or no, did you say, use this to tell us that the defendant was in an abusive relationship? Yes or no? Yes, question he interrupted her. Overruled, you may answer. Yes or no? It's not a yes or no. Do you want the truth, Mr. Martinez, or do you want yeah, yes or I'm no? I'm asking you questions. You seem to be having trouble answering my questions. I have if, trouble. If you, ha if you have a okay. problem understanding the question, ask me that. If you want to spar, do you want to spar with me? Is that, will that affect the way you view yeah, your testimony? The state. Be careful one, mate. We know you're angry, but Try and keep it within the boundaries. We love it when you toe the line and we, we, we go slightly across, but don't go all the way across, mate, please. Yeah, don't get thrown off. We approach on it. Yes. With regard to this particular case, ma'am, you did refer to this Exhibit 558, yes or no? I refer to it. Yes or no? Yes, I referred to it. And when you referred to it, Ms. Wilmot was asking you questions about it. Yes or no? Yes. And she was asking you questions about that, and it involved the defendant, didn't they? Yes. And it involved the defendant in your opinion as to whether or not she was somebody who was abused, correct? Not exactly. An asshole. Well, is it somebody that was not abused then? No, I, I yes, don't no. rely particularly just on that, and it feels like that's what you're trying to get me to say. Did you use this as in, in as one to, as one as one part? Right. Isn't as, that what you used? I used it as one piece of information. And what happened is you went to the diary, the journals, for example, right? You reviewed the journals here. Right? I reviewed the journals, and then you went to this, which is Exhibit Number Five Fifty Eight. And then you started to talk about how something in the journal was mirrored or set out in Exhibit 558, right? Something in just the journal? I'm not sure what you're asking. I, are are you know, asking me if the only... Let I, me ask it this way. Do you okay. remember talking to us about a lot of journal entries? Do you remember talking to us about that? Yes. Do you remember talking about certain dates? One of the things I love about his questioning is when he's with a hostile witness... He breaks it down and starts talking to them as though he's addressing a kindergarten class. And particularly with Alice, it is so satisfying, being that she is a professional 
and she probably would hate being talked down to that way. He has to talk down to her in order to get a straight answer to her. Yeah, because otherwise she goes off on a tangent. Yeah. I mean, we, we've heard her go on and on and on. She's rivaled Jodie in her monologues, hasn't she? <laughs> she has. But I just love his style of questioning when he just thinks, okay, I'm going to have to speak to this person like they're a six-year-old. He did it with Samuels. He's doing it with her. And I tell you summer never fails to make me smile. I love it. Right? Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember talking about what was written in those journals, right? Yes. That you, and you characterized what was written in those journals, right? Some of, some sure. of what was written in the journal. Yes, char- some of what was written in those journals, you characterized it, right? Mr. Martinez, I'm not sure what you're saying. With regard to the journals, do you remember talking about the journals? I do. Do you remember talking about specific dates in those journals, right? I do. And with regard to those journals, for example, with regard to the defendant, you indicated that she never said anything negative about Mr. Alexander, right? Objection is characterized as testimony. Oh, what do you mean, answer? Do you remember saying that? I said that I hadn't read anything that she said that was negative. So if you didn't read anything that showed that there was anything negative, in your mind there was nothing negative in those journals about Mr. Alexander, right? As written by the defendant, right? There were selections of those journals. Right. The journals that you reviewed here in court, ma'am. All of the journal selections that you reviewed here in court. And you did review more than those journal selections here in court, right? Yes. You reviewed all of the journals, right? Miss Miss Arias's journals. Sure. Yes. And during that period of time. Yes, you reviewed. I her didn't journals. read all of her journals. You read journals aside from the ones that were presented here in court, right? Yes, I did. So, as a result of those reading of those journals, you re- you then said to us, for example, well, there is nothing in those journals that is said by the defendant negative about the person that she killed, right? No, that's not true. She's answered. Her answer will stand. Okay. Tell me what negative things the defendant wrote about herself. I thought you asked me if she said anything negative about Mr. Alexander. Did you have a problem understanding the question? Tell me what negative things the defendant wrote about herself in those journals. That was my question. (laughs) Would you show me what you're referring to? No, you're the one that just told us that you read journals before you came here into court didn't you i just had a flashback when alice just said that um, would you show me what you when jody kept saying to uh, flores could i see the pictures yeah i just had a flashback then i did and you spent many hours correct yes i did and you charged 250 dollars an hour to read them right the standard fee mr am i asking if that's a standard fee apparently not And ma'am, and in those journals, the ones that you read, the ones that you can remember, can you think of anything negative that the defendant said about herself in those journals? Anything. She talked about being depressed. She talked about, and I, there are, there are numerous places where she talks about feeling bad about herself in places, not just in the journal, but in places. I'm talking about the journals, ma'am. Remember, that's what we're talking about. Just the journals. I read the journals. Right, what else? I read the journals, and you would have to show me specifically what you're talking about. I don't know what part of the journals you're talking about. And and frankly, I read pages and pages of journals, Mr. Martinez. I'm just talking about... So when you're asking me to say something specific about what she said about herself, I don't have... I had samples... Do you have samples to give me Ma'am, that I can see where I'm I... asking you from your reading of the journals, as you sit here today with the memory that you have intact, what can you tell us that she wrote that was negative? You did say that you read the journals, right? I did read the journals. argumentative and foundation date and time that he's referring to. Overruled. Right? You did say you read the journals, right? Yes, I did. Oh, she's walking into a trap. Because do you remember what one of Wilmot's last questions was? We'll get this out of the way. Do you have any memory problems? Yeah. There you go. Exactly. You, what, can you tell us that that is negative that she wrote in any of those journals? 
you're asking me specific comments she made, and I can't tell you specifically what she said because I don't have the journal with me. Oh, so in order for you to tell us what she wrote in the journal, you have to have it in front of your face so that you can read it, right? Objection argumentative. Sustained. Rephrase. Well, it seems to be what you're telling me is that your memory is lacking as to what was in those journals. Yes or no? No. All right, then give me another example of what you read in those journals that is negative that the defendant said. She says, she talks about um, not being productive. Okay, what else? She talks about... Um, She talks about um, feeling lousy about herself. Okay. Four hundred and forty-five unscrewed license plates later. She talks about um, not being not being advanced in PPL the way she'd like to be advanced in PPL. Um, she talks about not having her her goals, not not forwarding her goals in the way she wants to. Anything else? I'm sure there are other things. But you just can't remember right now, right? I can't. And all in all, what you've given us is a pretty positive picture of the defendant because those kinds of things that you're talking about are really not that major in the grand scheme of things, are they? They're not that major. And ma'am, with regard to this issue of how you conduct your work, the way it really works is that you conduct the interviews and we, then you look at other sources, right? I do. And that's what you did in this case with the exception that you only conducted one interview, right? The defendant's interview, right? I, yes. And in this case, we are left, if you will, to follow this roadmap that you gave us, which is Exhibit 558. That is, in a sense, a roadmap, right? It's a guideline. It's a guideline, which means we can look at it to guide us to a goal, right? It is a guideline. It is not a specific roadmap that will take you from here to here. I'm not asking, I've left the word roadmap behind. I actually use the word guideline. Isn't this a guideline that will take us to a certain um, decision or opinion by you? Isn't this in part, well, isn't this a guideline that you use? It is a guideline. And this is a guideline that you created, right? Yes, it is. So that you can change it whenever you want, right? I have changed it. Right. So the answer is, you. this is your guideline and you can change it whenever you want, right? Two words. Swiss cheese. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, with regard to using this guideline, isn't it true that you really don't even have to talk to any of the parties that are involved in order for you to reach your opinion? I don't use a guideline that way, Mr. Martinez. Well, are you familiar, back in 2010, are you familiar putting on a seminar and indicating that Snow White was a battered woman? Do you remember talking about that? Objection, Rollins. What? Did he just say Snow White? He, he did say Snow White. Who exactly <laughs> twatted her? I don't think anyone did. I've never... In Snow White, either the film or the or the fairy tale that I've read, heard any 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 description of her being chinned. No, neither have I. <laughs> I I'm just I'm speechless, stunned. Do you remember that? Yes or no? No, I. That's if you would like to show the the entire. YouTube video, I would be happy for the, uh, anybody to see that because I'm not talking, the title was, Is Snow White a Battered Woman? Because it was catchy. Right. So it does say, Is Snow White a Battered Woman, right? 
That it is does. the title of it, correct? It is. And in fact, in you, you gave this... Um, if you have as much credibility as Alice is supposed to have, why would you resort to clickbait? Yeah, you wouldn't. You don't, you don't, you don't, you wouldn't really need to. You wouldn't. Presentation, if you will, in Las Vegas back in 2010, right? I've given it more than once. In 2010, isn't it true that you gave this presentation in Las Vegas? I gave a short form of it. Yes or no? I gave a short form of it. Yes, I did. Did I ask you whether it was a long, medium, or short form? Well, there are different versions of it, Mr. Right. Martinez. I'm asking you whether or not you gave this presentation, yes or no. I'm not asking about the light. I gave, I gave a presentation in Las Vegas. Yes, I did. Isn't it true that you also gave that presentation in Los Angeles again in 2010? An altered version. But you did give this presentation involving Snow White and whether or not she was a battered woman in Los Angeles, right? Yes. Well, if you enjoyed Was Snow White a Battered Woman... Um, you'll probably enjoy Alice's follow-up paper, Did Jesus Drive a Honda Accord? Yeah. And one of the items that you use with regard to that in trying to determine whether or not an individual is a battered person, you look at 558. That's a guideline that you use, right? I did not use that at all in any of the speaking engagements, Mr. Well, Martinez. I'm not asking if you used it in the speaking engagements, in this case, for example, you talked about family of origin issues. Do you see that up there? Yes. And one of the things that you told us, well, you looked at the, or the family origin of Mr. Alexander. Didn't you tell us that? Yes. Well, if we take a look to follow up on your Snow White issue that you presented. Oh, boy, he's fun. Isn't it true that she had family of origin issues, didn't she? The family of origin issues we're talking about here, Mr. Martinez, are the fa family of origin issues for the perpetrator. Okay. So, in other words, in this case, you see Mr. Alexander as the perpetrator. You don't see him as the victim. No. Oh, so what is death doesn't make him a victim? Yeah, despite the um, gunshots to the head, the 27 stab wounds and the slit to the throat, he's not a victim. Oh, how classy is this woman? Jesus Christ. And so it's well, I see in I am looking at domestic violence and in regard to domestic violence, I am seeing Mr. Alexander as the perpetrator. And that is about the worst recovery you could make from saying such a thing, isn't it? Oh, that is the worst. I mean, how can you say he's perpetrator? I know. No evidence, just her word. And then just flat out said that she doesn't consider him the victim. Exactly. Words cannot express the contempt for which I feel for this woman. I hate her. Yes. And one of the things that we know about your presentation also is that, and, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is a fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm, right? Yes. And in it, we have an individual, that's the king, right, who is married and has a kid, by the, and they name her Snow White, right? Yes or no? I'm not using the Brothers Grimm version. I'm using the Walt Disney cartoon. I just want to make that clear. So there's different. All right. But it is true, though, that Snow White had a father, right? Yes, she did. And the father was the king, right? Yes. And it ends up that Snow White's mother ends up dying, right? Yes. And what ends up happening is that he remarries, right? Yes. And what ends up happening when he remarries is that he has somebody who is less than honorable, if you will, or savory with regard to her view of Snow White, correct? Yes. And so what happens during that situation is that there is a problem because this woman, the queen, begins to, if you will, abuse or be less than nice to Snow White, right? Yes. So what we have then is a situation where we have a father who has failed to protect, right? If we're looking at it from this global perspective, right? Yes. And so then, if we look at it that way, Snow White is sort of being, and I use the term loosely, abused. Not in the technical sense, but she's not being treated correctly, right? She's, a, she's being abused as a child, right? That's correct. And one of the things that happens after that is that the father sends her away. 
correct? She goes into the forest, That's right? Actually her realm is going this far into the Snow White story. The world. Right? She goes into the woods, correct. And in fact, when she's out in the woods, there's neglect by the father, right? Yes. So, for example, in this particular case, one of the things that you used in your evaluation was that the defendant, according to you, suffered some abuse as a kid, right? Yes. According to you, the wicked stepmother in her circumstance is her mother, right? I didn't say that. No, I'm the one that's asking the question. Isn't that true? I don't equate her mother with a wicked stepmother. Well, her mother, according to what you found out, hit her with a spoon, right? Right. And according to what we know is she allowed her father to hit her also, right? Yes, she did. And her father hit her, and at one point, you know, some of this. What do you know about what her father did to her in terms of any abuse that there may be here? There was one incident where he pushed her, and she hit a piece of furniture and lost consciousness. And the mother was present, right? The mo I'm, I'm not certain if the mother was present. Mr. Wouldn't that Martinez. be important to know? Not necessarily, because there were other incidents. What she has essentially helped Jody do in this case is throw every single other person that she knows under the bus. Her mother, her father, her sister, her brother, nobody has been safe. Even her own attorney. Yeah, I reckon she'd throw him under the bus. Why can't Alice see what poison, what toxicity she is dealing with here? She's blind. I don't think she's blind. I think she just hates men personally. Hates she men. She seems to be attacking them. Hates men and, and I suspect quite likes a particular woman. Yes, exactly. Pardon? There were other incidents. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not evaluating whether or not Miss Arias is a battered child, Mr. Martinez. I was looking at the issues of domestic violence. Well, ma'am, you're talking about abuse, aren't you? I'm right? talking about domestic violence between two adult intimates. And one of the things that you just told me that you did was that you looked at the background of the defendant. Didn't you just tell me that? I did. And you, you know about this abuse at the hands of her mother, right? Yes. And one of the things that happens, and we've talked about Snow White being sent out in the forest, one of the things that happens to the defendant, you're aware, is that according to what you know, is, isn't it true that before this she was the age of majority, she was, if you will, also sent out into the woods to go live with somebody else, right? She was not sent out. She chose to leave. So she left. In other words, she chose to leave. Why? Why do you believe that she chose to leave? Overruled. Did you see that look that Alice just gave the judge? I saw that she does not like it. <sighs> if looks could burn, that would have gone through stone. Absolutely. Go ahead. Why did she choose to leave? She chose to leave because she felt abused and because she felt controlled. By her parents, right? Yes. And she moved in with somebody by the name of... What? What was his name? Bobby Waters. And she lived in what is, can be best described as less than ideal circumstances, right? Correct. And the same thing with Snow White, right? She lived, lived in a situation with less than ideal circumstances, right? She lived with the seven dwarfs, and according to the Disney version, she was pretty happy. That's the understatement of the year. Well, she lived in a shack, right? I thought it was a cute little cottage, Mr. Martinez. All right. But there's seven dwarfs that she's living with, right? No one of her own age is there, right? I don't know the age of the dwarfs. Well, I don't. I'm sorry, I'm, but I don't. What I'm saying to you is, is it your opinion that there were other little kids that would play in the playground with her when she was living with the seven dwarfs? Objection, Ralph. That's argumentative. Overruled. You may continue. Judge Stevens seems to be of the same um, mind as us. Where the hell is he going with this? <laughs> yeah, is he trying to suss out the story of Snow White? I think he's try obviously trying to compare it to Jodie's story, but it's the way he's going about it is quite, quite haphazard, but quite entertaining. Yeah, very. 
Would you repeat the question, please? Is it your understanding that there were other little kids to play with Snow White in the out near the shack? Near, near the cottage, no. In fact, she was just there cooking and cleaning, right? Well, she was talking to the birds and singing with the animals. And cooking and cleaning for the dwarves, right? Correct. Isn't that so, sort of what you know about the defendant and Bobby Juarez, right? I don't know that Jody Arias was cooking and cleaning for Bobby Juarez. Do you know if he was working? He was not working. Do you know who was providing the money to buy the food? They were living with his family. Right, but do you know whether or not the defendant was working? She was working. Do you know whether or not she indicated on the stand that she was the one that bought all the food? I've not been privy to what she said on the stand, Mr. Martinez. Did you discuss it with her? That, that she bought food and sure. brought food into the house? Yes, she did. So essentially, Jody is a dwarf. She, <laughs> she is the seven dwarfs, isn't she? That's what Martinez is trying to say. Yeah, she's, she's one of them. She's kind of like the one who goes out to work. Hi ho, hi ho. <laughs> Except that you'd be out of tune with her. Well, our bloody song she sings will be out of tune. And then, with regard to Snow White, one of the things that we know is that something bad happens to her, right? The yes. incident with the apple, right? Yes. Somebody comes and harms her, right? Yes. And and we can take it different ways, but you know, do you know any incident involving her and Bobby Juarez? Yes. What is the incident that you know about? I know about a time that he um, choked her. I know that he, according to Mr. McCartney, verbally abused her. But never drank her blood as far as we know. Blood. So with regard to the choking, that's a violent act, correct? Correct. Just like this issue involving the apple is a violent act, right? Correct. And with regard to Snow White, we know that she ends up going unconscious, as we would talk about it in this day and age, right? Correct. And basically what's going on with her is that she's waiting around, right? For Prince Charming, right? Or somebody, right? She's, she's waiting around? Well, she's not going anywhere, right? She, when she's unconscious? Right. Well, when she's unconscious, she's lying around unconscious. Right. And then we have the kiss or whatever happens and Snow White awakens, right? Correct. And she starts to live with Prince Charming, right? Yes. Prince Charming! Prince Charming! And if we start talking about this issue involving the balance of power, in that particular situation, Snow White has no power, right? Objection relevance. Of the world. Right? Well, she's a queen. I'm not sure what kind of power she has. The king has the power, doesn't he? He's a good man and thorough. Objection, foundation. Relevance, foundation, speculation. Overruled. Right? Well, the king, yes, has more power. Right. And so if, for example, Snow White, in this relationship, if we're talking about the balance of power, in that case, she doesn't have much power, right? Objection, speculation, judgment, we approach. No! You may approach. You may continue. Based on your understanding now, who had the power in that relationship? The king or the queen? In the specific cartoon of Snow White? I'm talking about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs which presentation, which you have used on two separate occasions. Mr. Martinez, you're mischaracterizing my presentation. I don't do my presentation the way you're characterizing it. Ma'am, isn't it true that there's a syllabus that, in that indicates, for example, that from 11.10 to 12.10 in Studio 3, Alice LaViolette presented a presentation titled, Is Snow White a Battered Woman? <clears throat> Would that be true? That's the title. It was a catchy title. So is that yes? That would be true then, right? It was a catchy title, yes. So, yes, I am reading it correctly, right? You're reading the title correctly. You're not reading the content correctly. Ma'am, 
what this shows us is that with your approach and with Exhibit 558, even if no one's alive, even if it's a myth, even if it's all made up, you can still come to the opinion. Wait till he finishes the question. Finish your question. Isn't it true that you can still come to the opinion that the person in this fantastical world is a victim of domestic violence? That is incorrect. Well, that was not what I said in my speech. And my, I, I have said repeatedly that it is a catchy title, and I used it. But what I do in the speech is to talk about gender and power, and I talk about gender. Mr. Martinez, I'm not talking about Snow White actually being a battered woman. I, I use, well, you'd have to see the speech and you'd have to see the content. Do you know something? That is like me advertising a complete tour of the Whitechapel murders and then leading the group on a four-mile hike to look at a bloody cow pat. That's what that is like, basically. <laughs> misleading. Yeah, definitely misleading. Mr. Martinez. Putting aside your presentation, now we put aside your presentation, isn't it true that using your continuum of aggression and abuse, and by reading this myth, we can plug in and go through this and make an assessment that Snow White was a victim or was a battered woman. We can do that, can't we? No, we cannot. What? We absolutely cannot. There's an objection. Ms. Lamont. That's a mischaracterization of the continuum you called a myth. I, th I think you misinterpreted the question. Restate your question. Isn't it true, ma'am, that if we take a look at this continuum of, ag of aggression and abuse, which is Exhibit 558, if we use that and we refer to something that's wholly a myth, using your expertise, we can make a determination, for example, that Snow White was a battered woman, can't we? No, we cannot. Well, then let's talk a little bit about Snow White and whether or not um, we have some of these issues that are presented here. We're talking... Yes or no? Can we do that? Yes, can we do that? Could you do that with me? You're mischaracterizing yeah, it, Mr. Martinez. World. Right now, at this moment in time, Judge Stevens is my favourite person in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also, can you see the look on Jodie's face whenever she overrules? Yeah, and the look on Wilmot's face. Yeah. One has every right to pursue this. Whether it's relevant to the case or not, they've brought out nothing but irrelevancies. And crap. In the defence. And so leading. He's perfectly entitled, and I think that Stevens is giving it to him. Yeah. I would like to go through it with you. And what you've told us is that these columns are not necessarily exclusive, right? That is specific to adult relationship, adult intimate partner relationship, Mr. Martinez. And I have no information about the relationship between Prince Charming and Snow White. I don't know what their relationship was, so you're mischaracterizing that by saying that that can be applied to Snow White as a child. This is not about child abuse. Well, let's talk about, for example, whether or not we can find some of the items that were present in the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and whether or not Snow White was a battered woman, okay? With regard to your, the conference agenda, that conference agenda that we're talking about, it dealt with adults, didn't it? It, de it, it dealt with adults. Yes, it did. And in it, you said, is Snow White a battered woman? That was the title, right? Objection, yeah. ask the answer. Distinct. And that being the case, ma'am, now you're trying to tell me that, well, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk about Snow White now because it involved a child, right? No, that's not what I said, Mr. Well, Martinez. Well, then... Do you, then want, do you want me to answer that, Mr. Martinez? Yes, I, I can. I want you to answer me why it is now that you don't want to talk about Snow White as an adult when you did talk about Snow White as an adult when you made the presentation back in 2010. In other words, back up what you said or bugger off. I talked about Snow White in regard 
to growing up and what we believe about ourselves as men and women growing up. I did not talk about Snow White in an intimate relationship with the prince. What did you say at the end there? In an intimate relationship where? With the, the prince or the king or whoever. My question was a little bit more narrow than that. And my question was that in this presentation, this involved adults that you were talking about, right? I spoke to adults. And it involved adult abuse, didn't it? It involved gender. We were talking about gender and expectation about gender. And it was in a domestic violence conference, so I spoke about it in a domestic violence conference. Right, and it involved adults, right? It involved what we learn as children and bring into adulthood. So it involved what you learn as children and what now? Completely irrelevant and apropos of nothing observation here, but I absolutely love that expression that Americans have when they say, and the what now? At the end. <laughs> I just yeah. love it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I love the expressions. Yeah. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> yeah. You want to carry on? Fine. Cool. And, and what we can bring into adulthood about what we learn, what we learn as children. Right. And so, for example, if we have anger as an issue in the family, that's something that we can learn as a child and take into adulthood, which is what you told us about Mr. Alexander, right? Correct. And so we can talk about a number of things that are here and use this as a guide, can't we? To determine whether or not there's an individual is a victim of abuse, right? I'm confused. Are you talking about Snow White again? Because I'm, I'm not sure where you're going here. I'm talking still about... I'm, I'm no not one, understanding this. I'm talking about Snow White, Exhibit 558. Well, at least he's not saying what he used to say to Joe, do you remember? What are we talking about here, ma'am? Yeah. Do you remember that? It's her who's confused now, Alice. Yeah. Alice! Who the fuck is Alice? That is not applicable to Snow White and the prince's relationship, which is the relationship that that this is about adult intimate partner violence. And you keep referring to Snow White as a child. And what I'm saying to you is that that's about adult intimate partner violence and not about her relationship with the prince, which I know nothing about after they get married. So what, I, what you're saying is, though, even though this involved adults, and you did say is Snow White a battered woman, which would imply that she was involved with a man as an adult, right? You're saying that, disregard that now, right? Because it doesn't mean what it says, right? Her testimony. All right, we're going to take the recess at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, Monday, 9.30 a.m., please remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Have a nice weekend. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Ms. Lovellet, you may step down. Counsel, is there anything else for today? Just the issue that we talked about that you would address in private. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. I said just the issue that the judge indicated she would address in private with Ms. Lovellet. Uh, yes. Why don't we go back? In the hallway. No. So... An equally frustrating, um, satisfying, and amusing day of uh, testimony there. Yeah. An a examination. Lot of, a lot of different emotions in that one. A lot of them, yeah. A lot of different... Um, we ran the gamut, didn't we, of, of emotions, really, through that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was... Um, one thing I will give Wilma is she did try and, you know conduct her direct examination as comprehensively as possible. And she did, you know, cross off all, you know, dot all the I's, uh, cross all the T's and mark off every bullet point. She did try and do that. It's just like I said, though, she was polishing a turd. Yeah, and, and it couldn't be polished anymore. Yeah, exactly. And then Wankum gets up and immediately you know that she is rattled, Alice. Yeah, she doesn't like being talked to like that. You can tell. You, you can tell, yeah, absolutely. She's rattled from the get-go. And I think the further it goes on, I mean, I think some people have told us that um, she actually ends up in the hospital or ends up having to go home early or something from a day of testimony because it rattles her so hard. Oh, I can't wait to see that. Um, 
I don't like to see anybody, you know, really being bullied or anything, but given what she said about Travis on that stand yeah. over the past, like, three or four days, however long she's been on there, it would, just... be good, it would be good to see her kind of get a bit of payback, you know. All she did was decimate him. Yeah, decimating, um, you know, defame his character. Yeah. Try and strip him of his dignity. And he's, like we keep saying, he's not here to defend himself. He's only got Martinez to speak for him. His exactly. family can't do it in this forum. No, they can't. Not until when they give their impact statements at the end. That's the only time that they can address the court. The only person that can do it is Martinez. He has to speak for them. And, you know, for them, it must be so frustrating not to be able to, you know, get up and just tell Alice how full of absolute shit she was. Exactly, but bless them for for holding back. Yeah, yeah. Tremendous courage and, and so much admiration for, for all of their, all of them, all of them. Much love for them as well, haven't we? Yeah, we have. And wherever they are today, we, we hope they're doing okay. We hope they're doing better. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, there's more to come. This is by no means the last day that Juan gets to address this uh, travesty of, of testimony that she's vomited. Oh, not in the slightest. So um, we will be back as soon as we possibly can with part 46, day 42 of the trial. We will be. Uh, thank you so much if you're still with us. Um, you're absolute troopers. Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, thank you for all the likes. Thank you for all the, the, the positive encouragement that you all continue to give us. We know that this is dragging on a bit, don't we? Yeah, but we made it you is a what promise. It is. We made you a promise, didn't we? We said we would get through it. We said we would do it, and we're going to. So yeah. we're getting ever closer to the finish line, people. Um, stick with us, bear with us. We really do appreciate every single one of us that's of, of you that's on this journey with us. Very much so. Yeah, thank you all for all your comments. We really appreciate them. We really we appreciate your feedback. Yeah, and as always, our beautiful and wonderful Macclesfield mob for their tireless support. Thank you so exactly. much, guys. We love you. Okay, we shall see you for part 46 very, very soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Look after yourselves. And one, one love, love from, from Macclesfield. Macclesfield. Bye now. Bye.